So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those who are present here at the Patriot Hall of Carolinum, and good morning to you who are joining us online. Thank you for participating at this uh, international conference under the auspices of the Eastern Partnership University Cluster um, that was formed last year and uh, it's the conference is organized by Charles University. And I would like uh, to ask uh, Madame Rector of Charles University, uh, Professor Milana Kraličková, to open this conference. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Margareta Křížová for opening uh, today uh, this program. And I would like to welcome you all here at Charles University by the occasion of uh, uh, our Eastern Partnership University Cluster Meeting. The topic today is very important. We will be talking about the Bologna process and we will be talking about the best practice and we will share things that are key for the quality of uh, uh, our education. And I'm very happy that we are meeting here in such a um, rich uh, composition. Uh, I would like to say that Eastern Partnership University Cluster is something that is really deeply in the heart of Charles University and our partners uh, that uh, are part of the cluster together with us. And I'm aware of the fact that we are still not doing enough for our Ukraine, Moldavian and, uh, and all Eastern partners. And I would like to say here that I truly promise that we are going to even strengthen in the coming weeks and months our help, our support and um, I'm looking forward for all the cooperation which is going to take place uh, in this year, in year 2023. Um, I truly hope we all will enjoy today uh, and um, I will not speak longer because today is the day about Bologna process and let's, let's uh, go forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Rector. And uh, I wanted to say that uh, we, we are very thankful that at this event, uh, or that the whole idea of Eastern Partnership was supported by, by uh, the Czech 
uh, government institutions. Uh, also, I'm very thankful that from the beginning we have been in contact with uh, numerous uh, embassies at, uh, at Prague who are supporting also our, our effort. I, uh, I would like to welcome here uh, Mrs. Uh, Anne Glum, who is the head of science and economic department of the German embassy in Prague. And this event is also uh, co-organized by the German embassy because there are several German universities uh, either direct partners with an Eastern Partnership University cluster or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cooperating institutions, because really the Eastern Partnership was uh, established as an open platform, as a meeting place uh, for discussion and for sharing of good practices. So thank you, uh, thanks for, to, to the support. And also, uh, I am really thankful for the support from part of the Czech Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and also from uh, the part of European Commission, which has been, I, I might say, interested uh, also in, the, uh, in this, this project. So I would like to ask Mrs. Monika Ladmanová, the head of European Commission representation in the Czech Republic, also to say a few words at the beginning of our meeting. Thank you, Madam Prorector. So good morning to everybody. The Eastern Partnership University cluster is, of course, a very important initiative. And this is an important initiative for the European Commission and for the European Union itself. And this is not only because it's a valuable tool for promoting the basic European values and standards, like human rights protection, democracy, rule of law, but also for strengthening the education and research in the region, of course, and to help to solve issues such as the brain drain or the lack of recognition. But it is important for the integration of the region. And this is something which can significantly contribute to the peace and stability. Because by providing the education and research opportunities, we are also supporting the development and the regional integration, which can lead to the greater uh, elimination of risks of conflict in the region. And this is so important in the today's conflict, which we are experiencing for more than 12 months, the brutal aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Hence, the Easter Partnership University cluster is totally in line with the goals of the European Union, which is to have a stronger and more developed region. I would like to thank to the Charles University and to the Minister of Foreign Affairs for its ongoing support to this initiative. And I would like to wish you a fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ladmanova. And last but not least, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Jan Marian, the Special Envoy for Eastern Partnership of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, the Russian brutal aggression against Ukraine has changed a lot in the region, in the region of the Eastern Partnership. And now we have two partner countries with candidate or European perspective, Moldova and Ukraine. Still, the Eastern Partnership remains important framework for regional cooperation and for the cooperation with the EU. And I think this is one of the best examples how to bring the partners closer to Europe in the field of research and education. The enlargement process will not be an easy and quick one. This is why we, ha we have to do as much in the meantime as possible. And this is one of the best examples. And the, East, the, the foreign minister is always ready to support you. And I also hope that one day Belarus will be able to join this, this project. Uh, this cluster was launched during the Czech presidency last year. And for me, this is one of the most successful and most active uh, projects so far. I'd like to thank uh, you, Madam Rector, and of course, Monica and the European uh, Commission representation and the European Commission for the support, which is vital. And also, I'd like to thank the German colleagues and partners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, support and for your appreciation. And there's still a long way ahead of us. And so I'm so glad that this first official international event uh, of, the, uh, of the Eastern Partnership is dedicated to the Bologna process, the benefits, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, 
I would uh, like to stress the second and third word because Bologna process is what it says. It's a process. It's not a fixed thing. It's it's a way uh, to to develop. And uh, when I was thinking about the keynote for this uh, for this event, I could think of no one else but uh, Professor Kath Catherine Isaacs, whom I have known uh, for some time as one of the crucial personalities, precisely at the at the big, at, uh, from the beginning of the Bologna process. So uh, we will, before we will um, give the floor to Professor Isaacs, um, I would like to introduce her to those of you who might not have, have uh, met her before. Uh, you can find online a lot of information, so I will be brief in this and then I will add a few personal remarks. Uh, Professor uh, Kathy Isaac studied at the University of California and the State University of Milan. She received her degree in early modern history and I'm uh, saying this because uh, her studies in the uh, uh, European university history, European intellectual history actually translated into her effort to improve the present-day European academia. Besides pursuing her research, she has been for many decades active in a var variety of key projects and ed endeavors in international research and the modernization of higher education, not just within Europe. Uh, she has been deeply involved in Bologna process and the tuning process around the world in Europe, Latin America, Canada, USA, Russia and also Central Asia. She She's the ECTC DC councillor. Uh, she's Erasmus Plus ambassador for Italy. She's expert for the European Commission on the implementation of the Erasmus Charter for higher education. She's uh, active in Bologna process uh, follow-up group. And uh, okay, you, as I said, you can find this online. Uh, let me add my personal experience because I was part of one of the projects uh, Kate Isaacs uh, um, uh, organized under the sixth framework program, the Network of Excellence in the Study of European History. And at the time, I considered the, the highest benefit in uh, pursuing my own research, meeting uh, the colleagues uh, from uh, the other universities. There were, there were more than 30 universities involved in this big project. Only later, actually, I realized how transforming this experience was and uh, that the research part was just a very small part of it. I realized only in retrospect that the most important thing was that we all became part of the international community, that we understood that there is a diversity of perspectives, but one goal, which is to make the academic, international academic community more inclusive, to make it into the field of honest discussion and, and the pursuance of the, let's say, uh, European ideals of, of uh, research and of, of uh, economic freedom. And for this I am very thankful and also I'm very thankful and very honored that now when we are trying to push this project of European academia further, we have Professor Isaacs on our side and uh, she can help us and counsel us on our effort. Thank you very much and the floor and the screen is yours. Katie, you are muted, I think. Yeah. Well, then I will start over and just say very briefly, I am honored and also touched by your reevocation of the transformative uh, experience that we shared. Thank you. I, I think this introduction is exactly perhaps what is needed for me to be able to explain how I conceived of this uh, keynote in this way. It is a personal reflection. It is to give a kind of a context to what we are talking about, the Eastern Partnership, the EU and the EHEA, and also to try to give a concrete little bit of a contribution to this very important 
working meeting, which I would stress, I think that's the most important thing, a working meeting. So thank you very much. This is a kind of a short summary of what <laughs> I want to do, a, a, a kind of a time frame and a context. I can't help this. I'm both a historian and a witness, so to speak. So a time frame and a context of the EU and the EHEA, how a little bit about how the EHEA works, having had the honor of being vice chair for two years and a half between Paris and Rome, uh, something about the BICG, the Bologna Implementation Coordination Group, and its thematic peer groups, which are uh, where I see a real immediate and concrete help and support, not to the Eastern non-EU partners, but with the Eastern non-EU partners and all the partners together. A little note on virtual mobility that I see as a big part of your program and concluding remarks. So this will not be a surprise to you. The EU and the EHEA are related, but not everyone seems to know, and sometimes it's really surprising, how different they are, not only in geographical extension. I mean, the EU grows very slowly after starting immediately after World War II and only being able to really become its current self in 1993 because it worked through steel and coal, the economic community, Euratom, and finally became what we know and the 28 countries that are now, uh, in my view, unfortunately, 27, and the candidates and applicants that all through the years from 93 on, have been uh, slowly, many of them, entering the union. What about the EHEA, the European Higher Education Area? Well, did it start with a big bang? More, more so than the EU, and I think for a reason that's really interesting. It wasn't quite a big bang because universities were realizing in the 80s that they were in Europe, in Europe, Europe was the most different, diversified area of the world. The systems so different, so very different. I remember this very well as being a student and a professor at that time. The idea that they had to be able to communicate better led to the Mania Carta Universitatis in 88. And then in 89, what for me was transformative, beginning with the ECTS pilot project, the Lisbon Recognition Convention fostered and promoted by the Council of Europe. And then what happened? Let's say basically, universities, notwithstanding everything, realized that they themselves, without the ministries that were largely in charge of the higher education systems at that time, were not able to come together. And so the Sorbonne Declaration, where four of the six original members of the European communities uh, proposed this idea to have common structures, a credit system, and to work to be able to communicate together in a framework of diversity, not trying to be alike, but being able to communicate and to work together. And what did they do? And I discussed this with my rector who was actually there as the head of the uh, Italian rectors conference at the time with another of my ex-rectors who was the minister of education at the time. And he said they asked people to come to Bologna in 99, and they didn't think anybody would come. So I think this is significant because 29 countries came and decided to build this European higher education area by 2010. Now, to me, this is significant because it means that it grew from a will of the countries to come together then because they realized there was a need, a real need. Differences. EU is a federation, a confederation of, I'm 
European by choice. It has no hard power over education, but it certainly has been able to support very effectively a lot of things, Erasmus uh, research, of course, but it is not able to tell higher education what to do. But the EHEA is the same because it is a loose intergovernmental cooperation. It has no hard power at all. And it works through the consensus of ministers and practice in between ministerial conferences, ministerial personnel that of representatives of each of the, mem of the countries, 49 up until April 22, now 47, uh, the contribution of the consultative members, the transnational stakeholder organizations and some others, Normally, there no one votes. Everything has to be agreed, a long process. I thought it was interesting, so I made some maps just to clarify my own ideas right now. So in this one, you can see <laughs> Belarus and the Russian Federation for the reasons we are well aware of that are suspended. And I worked during the 18 to 20 period uh, being directly responsible for Belarus and trying to uh, enable them to make the necessary reforms. Unfortunately, political circumstances have interrupted that, as you know. The, um, uh, well, this is, I see the legends a little messed up, but the, the yellow countries are the EU countries today. The green countries, excuse me, are the non-EU -E countries, including the EFTA countries, Norway, uh, uh, Liechtenstein that you can't see, and Iceland. But this gives an idea that non-EU countries, many applicants, of course, or candidates, are, <laughs> are a very large group. And though I made a lot of these maps, but I'm only going to show you one more. Um, this is 99. Okay, and here, what, what is this? These are the countries that signed, the ones that came together when they said, come to Bologna. And look, you can see that the EU countries at that time were these yellow ones. The EFTA countries, of course, were those, Iceland and Norway as usual. But the non-EU countries, were the ones you see there, some of which are still non-EU, but many of which have entered. And then there are the other countries that have joined the EHEA since then. So what I would like to communicate with this is that the EHEA has grown, that it is a place where higher education becomes the link between countries that may or may not become part of the union, but higher education is what connects all of us in trying to build the higher education area together with the contribution of everyone. The Bologna process itself now is 24 years old. The EHEA, although people often speak as if they were the same thing, is not because it's only about to be 13. But in 2019 and 20, uh, the Rome communique was written in a visionary way. We had no idea, of course, that COVID and the current uh, unfortunate tragic events would come to interrupt or possibly to delay the realization of that vision. But uh, this vision is still there. It's still in place. It's still what the EHEA dreams that it will be able to achieve by 2030. The new communique is just is a communique that tells what has been accomplished and what the challenges are and how and if we will be able to get to 2030 with the realization of the dream. So how does this great blob of countries with its excluded, suspended part uh, members now work. I would say the, the words are slowly, 
and consensually from one conference to the next. Things only change officially when there is a new agreed communique, which means every word has to be approved by all the ministers. Voila, uh, a big task that I enjoyed being chair of the drafting committee for the Rome communique. A great experience, very formative. In any case, at the beginning, there wasn't even a Bologna follow-up group. We had a conferences, which were very interesting, valuable, and, in, and involved universities. Then this ended, and so there's the Bologna follow-up group that represents all the members and all its working groups that try to advance between conferences. Normal arrangements are that one, the country that hosts the next ministerial conference hosts uh, the secretariat and names the vice chair. There are two co-chairs every semester. And this is interesting because one is from an EU country and one from a non-EU country and they go in alphabetical order. So every six months, this changes. Whereas the poor vice chair is the one that has to mediate through all this. Anyway, there's usually one BFUG meeting uh, uh, and one board meeting each semester. But an interesting exception that I wanted to mention to you was um, the, the spring semester of 2020 when the chairs were Croatia and Ukraine. And since it was thought that we would have the ministerial meeting in May 2020, this did not happen because of the COVID, but there were going to be two BFUG meetings and two board meetings. And Ukraine said, we will host the BFUG meeting. And Croatia said, oh no, that's against the rules. We will do both of them. And Ukraine has insisted and mediation went on. And the last in-person BFUG meeting before COVID took over was in Kiev, March, 2020. And this to me is <laughs> how to say it's symbolic in a way. Of course, it makes dramatic the interruption that we have, have had to experience, but it also shows that the Eastern partners are truly partners and can uh, <laughs> take their rightful role in this blob of the EHEA. Okay, the working groups, each one has its co-chair, terms of reference, its roadmaps. And a thing I would like to stress is that any country can enter any working group at any time. It's not fixed as some may think. And work goes on all the time. It's extremely intense. There are the preparation of the contents of the communiques meetings, peer support activities, uh, all sorts of things going on all the time. The working groups are on all sorts of themes, and they really need the input from the stakeholders. For this reason, uh, we have, in this period, formed a task force on enhancing knowledge sharing to try to connect the uh, university world better with this, how to say, slightly ministerial bubble of the BFUG. And there are also the two coordination groups of which I am co-chair, the Bologna Implementation Coordination Group and the Coordination Group on Global Policy Dialogue. Now, I think that for uh, the all partners, EU, non-EU, East and West, the Bologna Implementation Coordination Group and its thematic peer groups are very, very significant because they try, we try to ensure that what are called the key commitments actually are implemented in the countries, all countries, all members, and that they're implemented, if possible, in such a way that they actually do what they're supposed to do. That is, put different systems in their diversity and the richness of their diversity into communication to facilitate mobility, to facilitate a connection of all sorts, so that actually this system, this 
area, often there's discussion about whether to call it a system. No, it's many systems. Many systems in an area can communicate. Okay, the three, let's say, key commitments, so-called, are the qualifications framework for EHEA. And here, of course, there's a difficulty because the European qualifications framework also exists. And uh, the, the countries have to self-certify to one, the other, both. ECTS, a major part of the key commitments because it indeed is what puts into communication our systems and facilitates mobility. But it uh, has to be remembered that it includes not only workload-based credits, but also learning outcomes and proper course catalogs, which I must say are not always to be seen or are perhaps less to be seen today than they were some years ago. The Lisbon Recognition Convention and the Diploma Supplement, well, Lisbon Recognition Convention, we have the NACNARIC networks, we have a series of challenges and important opportunities in the recognition field because of new phenomena or growing phenomena such as flexible learning paths, uh, micro-credentials, and particularly recognition of uh, the qualifications or even the pre-qualifications of refugees and migrants, which is something I think you will also be discussing today. Of course, we just celebrated the entry into force of the UNESCO Global Recognition Convention and the uh, UNESCO, um, the UNESCO qualifications passport for refugees and migrants, which is very similar to the European one. And these are all matters that are worked on in many contexts by the thematic peer group B. The thematic peer group C is for quality assurance and enhancement according to the ESG, the standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education area, which includes internal uh, quality culture, internal quality enhancement procedures, as well as external quality procedures and uh, the proper functioning of the quality assurance agencies according to EHEA principles. Just to show you, this is the, the membership of the TPGA. As you see, we Georgia is one of the chairs, one of the co-chairs, and you will see that there are also several of the Eastern partners in, uh, in this thematic peer group. Personally, I think, I mean, this is just my old fashionedness maybe, but I think that having uh, that the qualifications frameworks, the degree structure, even in the presence of micro credentials and other new kinds of learning experiences are very important. We have we went through the micro bowl project, which showed that the the classical EHEA's tools can be used for all the new kinds of learning in little bits that people can accumulate and stack throughout their lives. Uh, but to have this work, the, the, the qualifications frameworks have to be in place and they have to be calibrated. And ECTS also has to be in place so that the proper uh, understanding of learning outcomes and student workload is in place. Well, this strangely, you see a lot of countries there, but this is the smallest group. And there are a lot of countries that do have work to do, including Eastern countries that aren't here. Uh, so this is a place where I personally would very much recommend that the countries in the Eastern partnership, but also not, that aren't there, be there, and, and, and work not only to get their own system 
into sync with the others, but also to help the others, support the others in doing so. And this is always useful for both sides. The ones that think they have everything down pat and the ones that think they don't. Because in fact, sometimes, very often, uh, in the old countries, the changes in legislature were made in 99. Just imagine, things have changed since then. So it would really be important to participate for countries to participate fully in this peer group. In the recognition peer group, there are many more countries and we have a, a, in all these peer groups and the working groups too, we have projects financed by the European Commission through a special line of Erasmus Plus that do give support and really help, I have to say. So I didn't mention this in the slide, but it's very important. Also in the group B on recognition, there are a lot of things going on. And fortunately, there's also this financial support. There are a lot more countries you see already. And the quality assurance uh, group it's the same. There are many, many countries, including Eastern partners. So this is a place where things do happen, can happen, should happen. And requests for information and understanding and, and state of affairs should be made. Okay, I just wanted to share a final note about virtual mobility. That's something that <laughs> has been of interest to me and also to the history networks, uh, which uh, Marketa told you about for a long time, and virtual learning international learning environments. So this is, I saw that there's a lot of it in the program for today. So um, let me just say this. In the vision, I told you about the visionary Rome Communique of uh, which, in fact, was approved in an online ministerial conference in November 2020 because of the COVID. This is one, one a piece of the immortal prose in this, uh, in this communique. We affirm, reaffirm that our target, target of at least 20% of those graduating in the EHEA should have experienced a period, a study or training period abroad. We're nowhere near this. It was decided to continue to say 20% as always, even though we're no near, nowhere near this, and this is very unlikely to happen. And further commit, and look at this, to enabling all learners, all learners to acquire international and intercultural competences through internationalization of the curricula or participation in innovative international environments in their home institutions. And, and, and is very important. It doesn't say or, it says and. So all learners to experience some form of mobility, some form of mobility, whether in physical, digitally enhanced, virtual, or blended formats. So what does this mean? It means that the value, which was already <laughs> revoked by Marketa at the beginning, the value of doing things together and realizing there are different perspectives, different uh, insights, different challenges, different languages, different cultures, all this. This is something that the EHEA wants everyone, everyone, all young people, but all learners of whatever age to experience. So it can be, if it has to be, digital. And it's well worth, in my view, trying to do this. Mobility, that is, putting people into a situation where they have different experiences and richer understanding and insights is the reason for ECTS, for Bologna, for the EHEA. And the, the idea perhaps had a kind of an economic basis at one time, that is, Europe the space where everyone could travel around and work for whoever wanted them to work for them, maybe. But in any case, 
for education, for higher education, for our, how to say, for our political, our intellectual, our cultural being, well, it's very, very important for the personal, the personal experience of life of every European citizen. Free, untrammeled, fair, well-documented educational mobility. The implementation of the key commitments, the ones we were talking about, should make it possible. Not everything has been accomplished. Still, most of the basic pieces are there. So we can do this and we can push those countries that are not completely compliant to become so, so that it can all work. It all can work. Physical mobility will not go much farther. There are many valid reasons for that. The idea of being a student, that is you go to the university, you have X number of years, and then you are out of the university. This no longer exists. This isn't the way that our, our cultural economy uh, fun functions today. Lifelong learning, flexible learning paths, going in all directions according to the need of the person. This is a completely different context that universities have not really taken on board yet. And here, <laughs> there's a big challenge that should be expressed because if they do, the future will be one thing. If they don't, the future will be Coursera. In this vision, as I said, everyone should have the benefit of the international experiences. And now what we need is innovative thinking about how to do it. And this is one of the things I think you will be reflecting on today. We tried this, something like it, long, long ago in the history networks because we realized the, immense, the incredible benefit of having people do something, really almost anything, but doing it together coming from different countries. So we did organize, and this was 2006, it seems incredible now, the e-history learning environment and evaluation uh, project that uh, had six universities involved, Turku, Bologna, Hanover, Alcala, Uppsala, and the Finnish virtual university, because of course, Finland was well ahead in virtual learning because people like to stay at home in the winter. And there, my heavens, there's a storm here. Anyway, and we had six, we had 60 learners, 10 for, for each university, and they worked virtually using old fashioned web CT. And they worked in groups that were transnational, that were thematic, they worked at home, and they worked together. It was very interesting and very, very illuminating. Now we have so many other resources to make this kind of thing work. And we know that a carefully planned international digital environment really can add dimensions even some dimensions that you don't experience if you have physical mobility to one other uh, country, because it can put people from many countries to work together. So it isn't second best, it's something else, but it does need very careful and creative planning. I wanted to share with you this, uh, just this link and suggest that you go to take a look of this project that we finished on the 28th of February, so basically two weeks ago, which is called Enliven, Enhanced Learning and Teaching in International Virtual Environments. The inspiration came as COVID hit and the Rome communique was being written, and we realized that it's very difficult for universities to have in their hands all the tools necessary to develop that famous international dimension of higher education. And actually it can be done. And so this enlivened project, which had also a non-EU Eastern partner, Serbia, uh, created uh, tools for it, which are all uh, free access, 
and a survival kit, how to use all the the, the pre-access tools for building all different kinds of uh, <laughs> international digitally enhanced learning environments, examples, and guidelines. Uh, so this is the website, and I hope that you will be able to make use of it. The survival toolkit, the examples, I'm not quite sure they're online yet, but they certainly will be in a very few days. And uh, I think they can provide a strong basis for the work that you're considering, which can be very helpful in particular circumstances such as those we are facing now, but also more in general. I hope they can be uh, a help. Conclusion. Um, I think I'm just about on time. Flexible learning paths, micro-credentials, virtual international environments can contribute to inclusion. People who cannot travel because they have family, work, disabilities, whatever. More balanced mobility. You know that there's a huge problem of mobility going in certain channels and not in others. But this is a way to promote and enhance mobility toward the East, for example, towards smaller countries with less well-known languages so that people become acquainted with them and want to go and do, very important in my view. EHEA members, all EHE members, not just Eastern ones, can join any members is countries, remember, any EHE working group at any time. So if there are act areas where that need to be stimulated, I think it's very reasonable to ask your ministry, say, look, this is something important. Are your people really going to those meetings? Are they really standing up and speaking? Are they really saying we need this, we can do it this way and cooperating with the others to find the ways forward? Often, yes, other times, no, my experience is that some people take a step back and don't really interact with these areas of opportunity. In many of the working groups and the thematic peer groups, the ministries nominate an academic. Could be you. Maybe it's something to think about. All the countries need to participate, I think, actively, because this is what we are trying to build together. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kate, for this, uh, I think, very informative and at the same time thought-provoking uh, presentation. So the, there is now time for questions to the, to the lecture. We can return, of course, to everything that was said uh, afterwards in our first roundtable or then in, in the other roundtables in the afternoon. But now, if you have any questions, I have some, but I don't want to, to intervene. So you have a unique, unique chance to ask. OK, so then, uh, then I, will, I will maybe, uh, maybe start with, uh, as, as we discussed before, uh, I was, I was uh, asking about, or we, we were discussing the, this virtual mobility, which I also think it's a very important thing, especially you, we can see that, that our Eastern partners which are now on the screen, uh, could not come uh, to Prague, lamentably, but uh, are, are now with us. So also, please, if you have any questions, uh, those who are connected online, either write it in the chat or uh, just raise your hand and, and ask. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, Xenia, you, you wanted to ask something? No. Yes? Thank you very Sunny much. Up, thank please. You, thank you very yes, yes. Thank you very much. Maybe some some of my reflections and maybe some can I can I share also my ideas. So it could be not only questions, but and some maybe additional ideas for our mutual consideration. So first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. 
and concerning with the roots, how it was, and uh, what are these our next steps. And mostly, um, my attention was focused on that your last slides on the virtual environment that you stressed on that. Um, and for one side, we are see we are seeing this perspective of the twenty percent of the graduates uh, that should be include involved in the internal internalization and um, within the mobility as well, but at the same time, virtual mobility whether the virtual mobility could really gain the same aims of the um, of the open educational area uh, of course we are all aware that uh, virtual paths of coordinating and virtual mobility now it's the most important and the most fruitful thing that could be done but at the same time whether these virtual mobility could interchange the physical mobility that was formulated in the very beginning as the first A. This is maybe one, one of my observations. And another my ob observation that you told about the groups uh, and the specific uh, necessitiveness of the countries involved in the Bologna process to be included in the groups. Uh, how do you think it should be pushed by the governmental efforts? It could be pushed by the academic, uh, by the academia, because we can see that not, not always these states are at the same groups as you presented in your slides. And the scope of states are different. And of course, this is the formulation of the priorities of the state policy to be included in different task groups on the recognition on, on Lisbon Convention on recognition or on the uh, ACTS uh, tools and so on. So how you can really maybe advise from what kind of support it could be done from the bottom up from academia or from the governmental process. So just uh, maybe use my, my reflections, maybe not so as a question, but also with the sharing the, the, the observation from my side. And once again, thank you very much. Marquita, shall I, can I yeah. answer immediately? Simeon? Yeah, please, Simeon. please. Okay, well, thank you very much for these non questions but reflections, because of course they are they are really very important and also questions that I myself, of course, pose. One of the reasons that virtual environments and creating virtual environments really means also creating environments like the one we're in right now, where we're all talking together as if we almost as if we were together, not quite. Um, the fear has always been that that would replace physical mobility, of which we all recognize the great benefit. And one of the questions, of course, is how uh, it affects the feeling of being in another country and being in another country as a participant in the, the social, uh, cultural life of the, the feeling, the atmosphere, going to the restaurants, being with the young people, all these things that that's not necessary, that's not in virtual mobility unless we really work to put it there. And the fear has been, well, if you start to say virtual is okay, then the physical mobility will be out. On the one hand, when we started in the ECTS pilot project, mobility could only be for a whole academic year because most countries had no semesters, because all the different academic calendars were different. And so you had to go for a whole year. And of course, that was a life changing experience because you went to one other country for a whole year. OK, as time has gone on, shorter and shorter and shorter term Erasmus mobility has become the habit. So people go for one semester, maybe even less. And so that kind of full immersion in which you also get over the feeling of not <laughs> really participating uh, may not even ever happen. But so that 
there is on the one hand this kind of I don't know leapfrogging of uh, physical mobility, but the fact is that I think physical mobility is always a great benefit if it could happen. We saw uh, in the coordination group on global policy dialogue, we organized a, a colloquium with Mercosur in December, and they told us that for them, mobility is not a prime concern because it is what privileged rich people do anyway. So they need to use the money for their basic public uh, education, which is very understandable. In that case, too, virtual environments can be helpful. Now, what I think at this point, and I tried to show it, is that virtual environments for the at least 80% of people, but maybe with 100%, even those that do have a physical mobility experience can be very valuable, but it isn't it isn't that easy to organize. You have to really think about how to do it. In the Enliven project, we have some examples and tools. For example, uh, the University of Hamburg provided a series of formats in which you put the contents, but the idea is already there. As I showed you in A. Lee, we had people working in different countries on different themes, in person together in their own country, but then in a mobile uh, group online. And that was almost 20 years ago. I mean, really. And now we have the, the, the tools, the digital tools to do these things really well. So I think <laughs> your job <laughs> is to look at it not as an emergency situation. When COVID came, all universities said, okay, oh my God, we have to immediately go online. And they did. And But people continued to do what they were doing before. So now the big challenge is to say, okay, we've got a lot more tools. We didn't know we had them before COVID, but we can do something more creative, more useful with them. So that's the challenge, I think. And Oh, you did ask me another thing. Yeah, about the groups. The fact is that each ministry of education of member country, members is the correct terminology for the member countries, they can have a representative in any of the groups when they want. Uh, the groups have a fixed number of countries represented as it stands, but if a country wants to join, they can. There's no rule or block or barrier that they can't. So what does this mean? Well, in the different countries, as we know, the relations between universities and ministries are more or less complicated. Sometimes they're quite direct, other times they're not. But however it is, it's the ministry that has to name the person. But you, anybody, a citizen, a university, a group of universities, Eastern Cluster Partnership, somebody can say, look, my gosh, maybe we need to be in the TPG A. You might also, we might also write to each other about it because as I say, there's some people that are there that don't actually put up their hand and say anything. So it isn't that simple, but it can be done. And this is the work of the task force on enhancing knowledge sharing that wants to put universities, real life uh, higher education into better communication both ways with the EHEA. And so write to me if you want, and we can try to work out something. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your questions and reflections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you, Xenia, for your questions and, and for, your, for your insight. Uh, yeah, uh, please, Bernie. Uh, I will. Okay. Is this microphone working? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful, great. Benny Hasenknopf from Sorbonne University. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for your very nice presentation. I really appreciated it. And I would like to say also that I perfectly agree with you that virtual mobility is something that we have to develop. 
and we should not see it as a replacement for physical mobility, but as a complement. And we should still work on the physical mobility so that it's not only for the, as you said, the rich and privileged. <laughs> it's important for all of, us, all of our students. Uh, I had a question when I saw the list of members in the TPGs. Uh, not all countries are members in all the TPGs. And as I'm coming from France, I saw that, uh, for example, in TPGA, I think we are not member. Uh, but then I'm wondering if that is important for the implementation, because the communities, like the Rome community uh, you talked about, uh, is on the consensus. So from your experience, do you see any difference in the implementation if a country is member of a TPG or not in the different aspects there? So for example, is France less good in things that are discussed in TPGA and better in TPGB because uh, they are co-chairing it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very good question and thank you. Um, what I would say is that uh, uh, we have the Bologna uh, Process Implementation Report, the so-called BPIR, and right now we have the one uh, published that was prepared in view of uh, Rome. So it was based on data from 18, uh, 2018, 2019. And there are a lot of very nice maps, hundreds of them. I could have shared them. They're already done. I wouldn't have had to do them. Hundreds of maps showing how each little aspect of ECTS or the QF or quality or this or that is implemented a little bit more very well, perfectly in each country with colors. France is obviously not a country that has a lot of difficulty. It's a, a European Union founder country. It is a uh, it was the host of the Serban Declaration. So it's not a country in difficulty. And the fact that it's not in TPJ, TPG A, let's say, in, in most ways doesn't matter. To be honest, when I started re working with some aspects, though, of, I, I encountered some aspects of the French implementation of the QF because some there were some people that went to Andorra with some very iffy certificates they had received from some institutions or so-called institutions in France. Anyway, what I realized is that every country does have some issues if the country is in the TPG A or B or C. That's the perception of what it thinks it needs to improve. So I personally think that France can probably improve something. But the real reason if would for being in TPGA would be to support those countries that have not yet certified according to an NQF, a national qualifications framework, their compatibility with the QF. So it would be normally a support action. So, I mean, it's not something necessary, but as I say, both the, 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 the countries that are green in the BPIR, I will show you the link in the chat, and the ones that are red or yellow or orange or whatever, when they work together, they all find out that there are things that, that, can, be, that can be improved. Is that an answer? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions or comments? If I might, I have also, it's also more a comment than a question because uh, Xenia already took my question on the virtual uh, mobility. But I have another another comment on what you mentioned about the change in who is a student, because really I think this is one of the challenges that uni universities will need to face in the future. It's a change of the whole, let's say, attitude because the universities will not be the closed communities of students uh, in process and professors. They will need to open themselves to, to the uh, people who will just come, not for full cycle of studies, but maybe for some short time, or students who will finish their studies but still remain at some, attached to the university. And I think this is, this is something that we really need to take into account into the future 
is is this also going to be reflected more in the and that's that's from comment to a question in in the future negotiations of the european higher education area and i'm not just mentioning the micro credentials which are now uh, so hotly debate but this whole attitude of you know who is a student and what is the task of the university because we are still balancing between on one side this excellent science which we need to produce but on the other side of this inclusiveness towards those who actually don't want to continue continue maybe for the whole for the whole uh, academic career well Kita, thank you for this reflection and let me add my uh, reflection. I personally believe that this is an ep a, a epical change because, and it has to do with the fact that we no longer even speak of students, except when we say, oh yes, student-centered, but what does student-centered mean now? Student-centered learning, competence-based, output-based, student-centered learning, lifelong learning, flexible learning paths, what does it mean? What it means, in my view, is that today the idea that someone who is 19 or 18 or 20 enters a classical university, is there for X number of years, comes out and is done with it, it, it makes no sense. It makes no sense and it won't work. So if universities continue to be completely fixed on this way that they were, well, uh, they will be uh, become, how to say, emarginated. I, th I think the big leap that has to be made is to say that lifelong learning is not what we consider the kind of courses in how woodworking for uh, retired people. Lifelong learning means that you're going to need to learn all your life, not all in one degree program, but uh, going through different paths according to your needs that can be personal, cultural, they can be for your work, they can be just imagine the changes in the competences that are needed for, uh, let's say, interacting with our digital world. And so if universities understand this in time and organize to do it, which does not mean dumbing down in any way. It means being much more active and, uh, and, and foresightful. And my idea is that if anybody can foresee what will be needed in five years, it's going to be universities, not employers, and maybe not always citizens themselves. So universities will have ever more, I think, this task, if they can accomplish it, good. If not, we're going to see a different educational landscape. And I would also add one more thing about inclusion. It's very interesting in the, in the coordination group for global policy dialogue, we also have engaged with people in all the other macro regions, Americas, Africa, uh, Asia, Central Asia, where we are actively appreciating that the, the Central Asian higher education area is coming together. And what we can see is that one of the great concerns is inclusion, which means bringing people who were not from families that had access to university into the university. This may be, mean small learning bits of learning before entry. It may mean foundation courses. But then the problem is retention. How do you do that? How do you do that? This is what the other macro regions are worrying about. And they have some very interesting ways. The caring campus where support is given to people who would not normally be in higher education. Is this going to be a downgrade? No, I don't think so. I think it's going to be a very, very important phase for universities in which they can show their true worth, we hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Katarina? Switch it on. Oh, OK. <laughs> so first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, could you say maybe a few more words to this uh, project you mentioned and live in? Uh, is it a platform for giving best practice ideas 
uh, for virtual mobility? Because um, we are always in search of these, uh, these ideas, so it would be very interesting for us to know. Well, thank you. Let, yes, uh, actually, I was involved in writing it, the Platt project, and, but then the duties of, <laughs> of the BFUG and other things made it impossible for me to uh, work on it in during its actual <laughs> its actual implementation, but but then I was really thrilled to see what the partners were able to do. All the material is in the six languages, which of which the only one that is of an Eastern uh, non EU partner is Serbian, but there is also Estonian. Portuguese, German, Italian, English, and so forth. And everything is in all the languages, which is very nice. Maybe someone will want to add some languages. But in any case, it it gives um, another, the, the, the survival toolkit that I showed you, It you click on it and you find not only all links to all the... Um, normal and even some fairly rare uh, uh, tools for making modules and online environments and so forth, but also uh, very uh, detailed but clear, and from what I can see, I saw a lot of them, instructions on how they can be used. And also, as I said, formats and examples uh, of podcasts, of uh, of units for um, inter for creating examples for creating these virtual environments and virtual learning experiences. So I had the link in my slides. I will put it into the chat. And if you go there and click, I just hope you will find what you need. And also, once again, uh, please be in contact because uh, this is was done by my university, and we presented it in the la in an international conference at the, in the last week of February. And I do believe it can be very, very useful. Thank you. Okay, Catalina, but very last question because we need to move on. How can I turn it on? Oh, yeah, it's turned. Uh, so this is Katalin Nemeth from Atush Lorand University, Hungary, and I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, blended intensive programs, how you see the role of short-term blended mobilities, especially blended intensive programs uh, in this whole process, uh, uh, especially that um, in the context of also Eastern partnerships, um, because uh, as we know, the um, Non-EU participants do not count towards the minimum number for participants when it comes to Erasmus fundings, and this is probably uh, an, uh, like a challenge, uh, even though we are uh, still, st I think, struggling with the implementation of uh, BIPs ourselves. Uh, and also in the context of the duration of the physical part, uh, I'm also very interested what you, how you view it, whether it makes any difference of uh, or how long is it? Because it's also a very flexible format now. We uh, can have like a minimum of five days and then 30 days is the maximum. So so from the learning point, uh, learning process point of view, how, and from uh, how do you see it? Uh, what What is their place? What is their best implementation? <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that if it were a reflection, it would be easier to answer. But it is a question. No, how do I see it? Well, I mean, I mean, I. How to say? It's a challenge when the rules make it difficult to do what we feel we need to do. It certainly has been. It was a great opportunity to be able to add add the K one hundred seven mobility in Erasmus Plus the K one hundred seven one now, but we have also seen, and I think many have experienced the shift in emphasis, for example, to Africa, that has, uh, maybe Lucy will have something to say about this or, but anyway, the, the fact is that it, it's very difficult now. At the beginning, it was very easy. It's very difficult to have financing for some forms of mobility. It is true that, uh, 
things are much more flexible than they once were, and shorter term mobility is feasible in some cases. My personal view is that uh, if there's a chance for physical mobility, take it. Blended, I understand as being uh, with a small amount of physical mobility if possible, but otherwise it can be with a group of international learners working together in a university and some of the people will be in their home university. But if they are in a group of people from other countries and in virtual rapport with people from in other universities in other countries, it is a form of how to say blended, blended, blended virtual and physical uh, international environments. And with imagination and creativity, this can be done. It can be it can be very useful. I don't know that it's optimum, but maybe it is. Just think of a physical classroom where you have, I did actually do this in my own courses at one point, where one half of the students are Erasmus students and one half are local students. So they work together and then online with similar groups elsewhere. That's something you can organize. So it, let's say it exploits what physical mobility there is in a virtual framework. And so that the, this, the richness of the different perceptions, understandings and contributions can come forth. Is that an answer? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I regrettably have to cut the discussion on this point. I would like to thank once more to uh, Kate Isaacs for her for her presentation. And we will we will pass on to the round table which we envisioned as a series of very short presentations like for provoking discussion and then uh, then uh, continued discussion. So maybe, maybe we will return to some of the topics we discussed. Actually, the first presentation will be online by um, uh, Professor Aurelia Hanganu, who is a vice rector of the of the um, uh, Vice Director for Research and International Relations for Moldova State University. And she will talk about the doctoral studies in the Republic of Moldova in line with the new code of education. So, uh, Madam Vice Director, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Marketa. Hello, everybody. Hello, dear guests and dear colleagues. Um, uh, and uh, special thanks to, to Charles University for organizing this event and giving us the opportunity to discuss different aspects of uh, Bologna process. Uh, as Marketa has underlined, uh, this is a process and uh, we have um, uh, to deal with uh, with provocation that, um, that, that arrive in our uh, daily life. So uh, I, I proposed this, um, uh, this uh, topic for, for discussion. Uh, and uh, as you may see, I hope that uh, my screen is visible to you now. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. So uh, if you may see that uh, I put it in uh, the word new code of education, as far as not so new in terms of years, it was adopted in 2014 uh, in the end of the year. So, um, but uh, still uh, we have some, uh, some um, uh, aspects of um, uh, higher education that um, is put in place uh, only partially. Uh, and the discussion is about the doctoral studies at doctoral level, as far as is the third level of the education according to the Bologna process. And uh, it is a level that was uh, a little bit different um, uh, approached by the community uh, during the 
transformation from from uh, uh, from a first uh, research first step of a research career and uh, um, uh, appreciation level of uh, research education uh, research activity in uh, former uh, um, research institutes um, in the Republic of Moldova and um, transferring it to uh, educational level which should be done in uh, higher uh, education institution. So um, uh, this is the situation that uh, uh, in our days, uh, the present moment uh, in Moldova, we have actually two ways to get the PhD degree. One of it, it is um, uh, doing this doctoral studies uh, in doctoral schools uh, according to the pro Bologna process. And another one is continuing, continuing that uh, education that was in the uh, uh, research institution uh, in uh, the frame of uh, Academy of Sciences of Moldova. Um, uh, the, just one parenthesis here. Um, this year was the, the great year of reform of uh, research system reform in uh, our country. As far as all the research institution was uh, transferred to the higher education system and Moldova State University, our university get uh, 13 institutes from, from a total of 19. So uh, uh, now we are uh, keeping the whole, uh, the, the, the uh, biggest part, the biggest part of the research capacity in our uh, country. So um, the, the, the reason why the doctoral education was so hard um, accepted by the by the our community um, uh, arguing between it educational level and the education purpose and the, the research activity which is done uh, in uh, the frame of doctoral education. So uh, changing the accents from uh, being a prestigious initial car research career to an educational level was um, treated like um, uh, diminishing the importance of doctoral level and the, the uh, research career here in the research in uh, in our country. Uh, as far as I have told, initially the doctoral studies was uh, given in the frame of Academy of Sciences, and after that in um, the universities uh, in our university. Um, of course, the problem uh, uh, which is um, dealing with the high teaching skills and mentoring commitments of the person uh, that are arriving in the situation of uh, uh, doctoral uh, mentors and uh, uh, supposed to or opposed it to low financial income and hard work of the doctoral student that should be given that uh, or the um, low um, uh, payments for the doctoral students and the doctoral bourses here in Moldova is a problem that um, uh, now uh, is not um, encouraging the young researchers to do and to uh, start a research uh, career. And of course, um, uh, as I've told, the, the, this reform, which started in 2015, the first, first year of including the uh, research, the doctoral education according to the Bologna process, uh, is still in the process, still in, uh, uh, in process here in Moldova. As far as we would like to have this doctoral program accreditation, which uh, wasn't done at the present moment. So, uh, as I uh, told in 2015, it was the first year of uh, enrollment of the doctoral students according to the new code of the education. And there were about 50, um, uh, five, 500 of students in 41 doctoral schools. And the, the situation was like this, the, the, the whole, the whole the, um, universities in our country were um, uh, like in competition to create more and more doctoral schools in order to, um, to attract the doctoral students. But at the same time, the regulation said that for all these uh, structures, we should have um, uh, different uh, budget lines. So uh, the ministry wasn't very generous in this uh, part. So this is why uh, after seven or eight years, we have uh, um, the, the number of students uh, almost the same, but the number of doctoral schools was, was actually divided. 
uh, and now we have only 24 doctoral schools and Moldova State University uh, reformed the 19 uh, previous doctoral schools in only six at this moment, as well as the Technical University of Moldova, they had six doctoral schools and now they um, decided to keep only three of them. Um, this um, diminuing of doctoral schools um, uh, is um, arriving other questions and other issues to be discussed as far uh, as in um, in the frame of the same doctoral school we have a lot of uh, students with different uh, um, uh, preferences for different disciplines so uh, uh, we have uh, uh, for example, the School of, uh, of Humanitarian uh, Sciences, uh, here the history, the philosophy, the letters, uh, all kinds of letters, uh, including uh, inclusive uh, uh, languages and translation studies, uh, and uh, also history of sciences uh, per uh, discipline, per uh, um, all kinds of sciences. And it puts uh, different uh, question about the, the contents of the discipline and the content of the um, curricula that we should uh, propose to those uh, uh, students. Of course, uh, uh, we have uh, um, preserved uh, at this moment a kind of uh, double standards. It's not my pleasure to say the sort, but uh, we have uh, differences in admission process for the students uh, that are paid from the um, uh, state budget and from their own, uh, from the personal uh, funds. Um, as far as the uh, state budget for the doctoral students is given by the competition, by a national competition. Um, but those person who wants uh, personally to pay for, for their uh, doctoral studies, they may only approve the, the, the um, topic for their research within the doctoral school uh, they are uh, accepted. Um, at this moment, uh, we um, tried to organize the educational uh, phase of the doctoral students as far as we do it at the first year of the studies and the, the second and the third year they are dedicated to the research itself. So uh, the basic educational part, which uh, should give them scientific and transversal information, and uh, here um, uh, we tried um, initially to give different um, discipline and different curricula to uh, every um, uh, doctoral school, but uh, this last year we uh, tried to give general courses for all six doctoral schools, and it was very interesting to um, to understand the difficulties and to understand the um, uh, particularities of the uh, necessity of the doctoral students in different fields. And the research work, uh, it is the most important part of the, uh, of the thesis, but also um, According to our day regulation, it should be done within three or four years of studies, of the doctoral uh, studies, doctoral level in the university. Uh, but after that, uh, we have a lack in, um, in, our, uh, in our legislation as far as we don't know uh, how to proceed with the, with the students that uh, did their ed doctoral education, but didn't um, uh, succeed to uh, defend their PhD thesis uh, publicly and get the title. Uh, so um, uh, it was up to university to decide to every university what uh, way they will proceed. Our university accepted uh, um, the formula that is um, uh, applied to the general level of the education, bachelor or master, to, um, uh, to give them the possibility to uh, continue with their study, but uh, this time on the paid uh, basis. Um, of course, there are different administrative and financial issues, uh, as I've told, because the, the, we have this division um, between the scientific committee, which is um, uh, dealing with the doctoral education in the university, and the Senate, 
which is the organ, uh, the collective um, uh, organ in the university dealing with all kinds of the problems. So the regulation said that the scientific committees should be separated from Senate and it's somehow we have double um, uh, collective organs here in university deciding on different uh, issues uh, of the education, but the education we are treating the whole process of education from the bachelor to the doctoral level as well. The president of the scientific committee is an elected uh, member of the rectorate, which is uh, again uh, um, in opposition with the general regulation that uh, is allowing to the rector of uh, higher education system in Republic of Moldova to, to designate by themselves the member, the, the vice rector in the university. The director of doctoral schools um, are, uh, um, are um, elected, elected person, elected members of our, our community. Um, but at the, uh, the same time, they are very different um, by the um, task volume. Uh, as far as, for example, the um, uh, doctoral school, school of exact sciences is only 30 students, uh, but the doctoral school of the uh, educational science, for example, is 200 of students. So the, the volume of work they, are, they, ha they have to deal with is uh, very different. And the doctoral project, as I uh, told you, uh, these differences between the uh, personal paid uh, uh, studies and the budget uh, one. Um, <clears throat> um, which um, <laughs> um, which way which we um, uh, tried to apply one um, integrating these research institutes in uh, in uh, university work and uh, in doctoral studies? Um, in our case, uh, it comes uh, naturally by um, by. Uh, absorbing this uh, research institution, but the, at the same time, we have the medical uh, um, and pharmaceutical university here in Moldova, State Uni uh, in Moldova, and they are dealing with a different situation because the, the, the institute, institution that are participating in uh, doctoral education, they are not uh, related legally with the university itself. So the um, uh, finding that the um, uh, the, the decision was clustering doctoral schools and doctoral and uh, institution in a whole doctoral uh, um, consortium, let's say, uh, which uh, should uh, participate equally at the educational part from one side at the research part for, for the um, other part. Um, adapting methodology in general courses and innovating the educational process is a thing that um, is uh, going with the general uh, Bologna process um, uh, recommendation. And uh, even those discussion which was um, uh, reminded today about the credential, uh, micro credential in education, and also the uh, mobilities and um, accepting the course in mobilities in different countries, as well as the joint uh, doctoral education with different universities is a, is a process that should be still discussed and still carefully uh, proposed in, uh, in our case and maybe in our university also. Uh, the doctoral program accreditation uh, is uh, our most um, uh, painful <laughs> moment as far as it not started yet. And uh, the, uh, the provisional uh, accreditation that was given to the doctoral, school, uh, uh, doctoral schools here in uh, uh, Moldova was uh, already expired. So now we are a kind of in the middle of the last uh, um, accreditation and the future one that we don't know exactly when will be happen. Hopefully, uh, with this uh, engagement of the uh, uh, Republic Moldova state to to um, uh, to adhere to the European Union uh, community, uh, the the whole 
other process that were able to put it uh, on standby uh, during this period will uh, have another attitude and another um, uh, speed uh, and uh, uh, to give us possibility to uh, work uh, further. Uh, the, the last point that I pointed out, that the avoiding double system for obtaining doctoral diploma, which is now um, uh, a problem for, uh, for, the, for each institution here, a higher institution here in Republic Moldova, but also for our national agency for um, uh, quality research insurance and quality insurance in education, uh, as far as they are um, putting in place double methodology to uh, approve this doctoral diploma given by the university. So uh, in short, that was uh, my points to propose for, for discussion. Maybe uh, some um, Equivalent problem could have Ukrainian uh, colleagues, Ukrainian university, but uh, I understand that the European university is going uh, with uh, not many uh, problem with organizing the doctoral uh, education in their university as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for this presentation. I, I think all universities are struggling with uh, PhD, PhD programs. I think this is, this is one of the, one of the most, uh, most uh, pressing and, and sensitive issues. But thank you very much for the, for the presentation. If you, if you don't have any really immediate questions to clarify something in the presentation, I would suggest that we move on with, the, with the all four interventions and then we can go back to the general discussion. So please save your questions that are more general. Uh, and I will now pass the word to Bernie Hassenkopf, who is the Senior Advisor for European Commitment at Sorbonne University, and will talk about the competency-based approach for study programs, which I think it's perfectly in line with what we have just heard in the keynote and also in this, in this intervention from Moldova. Thank you. Should I stand up or should I speak from here? What is... It's up to you. Or what is better? It's better to go... Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I will speak from here. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Charles University, all the team for organizing this. Uh, we already heard this morning how important the European uh, partnership, Eastern partnership is, and uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. And I can really say that for Sorbonne University, all the points that were mentioned this morning are high priority, all these issues with uh, partnership for the Eastern societies and, of course, the academic institutions. I would like to share some idea, or one idea, actually mainly one idea, about an undergraduate program. We heard about graduate programs at the moment. Uh, okay, there it is. And uh, the idea is making, building competency clusters, so having a competency-based approach. We had this very nice uh, talk about uh, the European higher education area, the Bologna process, which is around for some time now, that has so many promises, that has so many achievements already, that is still a process where we still have things to do. And we have guidelines how to do that. For example, the ECTS guide says something like this, and I just read the first sentence, a dynamic combination of cognitive and metacognitive skills, this is to um, define competence, knowledge and understanding, interpersonal, intellectual and practical skills, ethical values and attitudes, and so on and so on. Uh, and this is important for all programs and all courses and modules. So that is important for all our teachers, all our academic staff. But if you present them a text like this, they will be totally lost. As a chemist, I would say there's a much too high Activation energy. Activation energy is the energy that you have to put in in order to get above a barrier and then you get to a better result and so better teaching. So this activation energy with these guidelines is too high and we have to find a way to make it smaller and make the thinking about it easier. And we already have some ideas again in the ECTS guide. Those are the learning outcomes, and I really would like to stress the advantages of those learning outcomes and to use the learning outcomes. 
Learning outcomes express the level of competence attained by the student and verified by assessment. This is how it's formulated there, again, a little bit maybe difficult, but it's something that you can explain to all our colleagues. You just go and tell them, well, think about your course. You are the head of your course, you are the master of your course, but just tell me at the end of your course, what are the students able to do? And write this down. And that normally all our colleagues are able to do. Maybe you have to explain a little bit because they are still very much content focused and they should go a little bit more to the student side, but this is something that you can really discuss. And you can collect all these inputs and then you need a group of some experts for the program that collect them, that analyze them, and then build what I call a competency framework or they use of course, they get inspired by some competency frameworks that are already around, and they group together all these things. Some of those modules might have to be adjusted, but uh, they can be grouped together into what I call competency clusters. Competency clusters means that modules that are similar uh, are taken together into one cluster. Uh, this is where you maybe have to rearrange a little bit because you say, well, you would feel very well into that cluster except this small little detail, so then you can discuss this much easier with the colleagues. As an example, this is how it would look like for a typical master program, the one that I directed over the last eight years, um, which was a master of chemistry, and where we defined finally four competency clusters with some modules that are fundamentals, some modules that are for the specialization, because in chemistry you can have different specializations, and there are some general competencies and internships that all students have. So you group this together. The advantage is that now you can really say to um, each of your, your colleagues, each of the teachers, uh, well, your course is in this competency cluster. It, co it is there because you told us your learning outcomes and they fit in here. And this is the context, these are the other competency clusters, so you don't have to care about that. You should care, more care about those, uh, those competencies here. You distribute these competency clusters over the two years, so they are not all taught at the same module, so they are, you can see here, over the four semesters of a typical master program. So, in summary, this idea, very short, is something that you can elaborate with your colleagues and you can recognize their contributions. University teachers, I think you will agree with me, are ahead of a bunch of uh, uh, independent people who think about their course and they want to do their teaching. <laughs> so let's start with that, what they want to do, and then try to build from there. But in order to improve things, we have to do scaffolding, we have to decrease the um, activation energy. And I think the learning outcomes, and I really want to stress this idea, which is of course in the Bologna process, learning outcomes are a way to scaffold and to overcome these obstacles. There are a number of advantages if you make these, um, what I call competency clusters. You can recognize more easily similar modules within your own program, but also with programs from elsewhere, and this is where the mobility comes in, so then you can say, well, what you have done at this other university, that fits into this competency cluster in our university, so you get the, you get the equivalence of that, and so on. And it's also important for something that we mentioned shortly this morning, the easier integration of lifelong learning, because you can look what someone who is already in the workplace who has 10 years of work experience, um, what competencies does he already have? And so then he can, for example, already validate a full competency cluster of your master program and has only to do some other problems. So you are not thinking about he has to do this semester or he has to do that semester, but he has to do this competency cluster instead of that one. So that was this idea, which I'm happy to discuss with you a little bit further in detail this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is, this is really uh, thinking out of the box, I think, uh, precisely within the frame of uh, the topic of this conference. But thank you very much. And uh, okay, any 
immediate questions, requests for clarification. If not, then I will ask the uh, third presenter, which is Stefania Scuderi, uh, the postgraduate and international relations um, uh, officer from the University of Milan, uh, who will be uh, who will be speaking of correspondence of grading scales and higher education. Okay, so good morning everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. It's my first time in Prague, and so thank you for having me and my other colleagues here today. Um, my, okay, it's like this? No. Nope. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll go briefly um, over some of the uh, mainly obstacles and challenges we all uh, have faced and maybe still face in full implementing the uh, principle of the uh, Bologna process and in uh, reaching and achieving the um, automatic mutual recognition of qualifications and learning uh, um, periods uh, completed abroad. Uh, envisaged by the Lisbon Convention and then resumed by the um, the um, Council recommendation of 2018. Um, the, um, the country represented here uh, today have all agreed uh, in trying to uh, reach and uh, implement the uh, a principle of the Bologna process, but we still face a lot of challenges in terms uh, of what is like workload of learning outcomes and assessment procedures when we talk about uh, um, like study uh, mobility or final uh, degree evaluation when when we talk about uh, uh, degree mobility and when we also uh, try to um, uh, come together and design uh, and, and design to design or uh, 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 work for a joint degree. Uh, we all face problems uh, when it comes to accreditation or validation procedures in our countries when we want to uh, implement a new study program. Uh, the, this is a list of the tools developed so far uh, that helped us uh, uh, reaching a lot thanks to a learning agreement, a transcript of records, uh, Agricons, ACTS. But um, what we can do to uh, try to uh, reach uh, the automatic recognition uh, by 2025 or reach uh, the European higher education area by 2030, uh, give access to institution a ACT as scales, for example, and uh, um, joint admission procedure and, and joint conversion tables in terms of degree mobility, or uh, uh, try to fully implement the 2015 ECTS, ECTS users guide, and uh, also uh, at moral national level, try to strengthen the role of national academic recognition information centers and uh, um, try to also develop the um, transparency tools um, such as dip diploma supplement uh, uh, and others. And what UNIMI does when it comes to uh, grading scales, uh, we uh, we do it at departmental level or faculty level because we are like a um, uh, multidisciplinary uh, university and uh, we try to um, use like a statistical distribution table of the passing grades in uh, um, awarded in a specific program or field of study and we try to share them with students before uh, their exchange period, also with, uh, with academics. Um, departments usually, they um, published online on their website the conversion uh, scale uh, for, uh, for students and uh, to, uh, to, to consult before they, uh, their departure. 
and um, also when uh, when it comes to uh, the green mobility, uh, we uh, try to um, come to an agreement with our partners about the uh, conversion scale we have to use um, and inserting in the uh, consortium agreement uh, that then needs to be approved by our uh, governing bodies. And just to be sure that uh, uh, there is like um, a transparent process for the students when, when they apply for a double degree or a joint uh, uh, degree, they know for sure what they will expect when they come back home and have their uh, grades converted into our our grades. So this is like more, as I say, as a starting point uh, for uh, a discussion among us about uh, uh, what we actually do to fully implement the, the Bologna process and what I, I would like also to know what you do uh, uh, for, uh, for the conversion scales in your uh, own institution. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are, we are uh, already starting to, to see some patterns that, that uh, I think we will be, we will be discussing uh, further in the day because these are, these are all very pressing issues. I think the conversion, conversion uh, from my experience in participating in joint degree programs, this is, this is something that really needs to be taken into consideration. But before we, we start discuss this, uh, last but not least in this, uh, in this first block of roundtable, I would like to welcome another online participant, um, uh, um, Sergei Riznik, uh, Vice Rector for International Affairs from Ivan Franco National National University of Lviv, uh, who will be talking about teaching and research in times of war, challenges and approaches of, as for responding to them. I think we we really need uh, need this uh, this presentation to remind us of uh, the the gra gravest obstacle nowadays for pursuing our goals of joint cooperation. Mr. Vice Director, uh, we are listening to you. Uh, dear Marketa, thank you very much. Uh, for this possibility to take part in this excellent event. It is very interesting, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, I really regret that uh, this time I cannot be uh, present at the meeting in person, uh, but it is really great, great honor for me to have this opportunity to address you on such an important topic as teaching and research in time of war. And uh, really, maybe maybe my uh, short speech will be more emotional uh, than my, uh, the speeches of uh, my colleagues. And uh, I think it is obvious because uh, we continue here in Ukraine uh, to live in a very difficult and uncertain time still. And after the beginning of the full-scale invasion um, of of uh, Russia, Ukraine faced new, uh, absolutely new challenges that uh, were hardly imaginable in, in the civilized uh, world in, in the 21st century. And uh, during this period, more than uh, uh, one year, uh, we went through different stages. And of course, um, the first reaction was uh, shock, for someone even fear and um, which clouded our minds and kept someone from, from even thinking clearly. To be honest, uh, later this uh, shock and fear gave us uh, the possibility to think in another way and to rage and anger even. But in the end, we realized that life has to go on and we need to continue uh, working hard for the benefit of uh, our country and uh, the entire international and especially European community for uh, the sake of peace, freedom and uh, democratic values which we all, uh, which we all share. Uh, after all, when, uh, we, we understand now completely that when Ukraine wins and Ukraine definitely wins this war, we will need 
a generation of uh, powerful ideological and patriotic Ukrainians uh, who will build a qualitatively new state. And our mission as a national university is to educate such uh, people now and after the war. And that is why we do our best to ensure the high quality of the education process, uh, despite all these challenges, as we recognize our uh, important role in strengthening um, the Ukrainian educational system. So uh, since the beginning of the war, Lviv University especially has opened its doors uh, to thousands of internally displaced uh, students from different universities across Ukraine. And uh, some uh, were forced to flee for their lives. Others couldn't continue their studies at their home universities as the infrastructure of some of them was barbarically destroyed. Uh, therefore, we could not afford to panic and uh, shortly after the beginning of the full-scale uh, invasion, we decided to return to the educational process, uh, which was stopped, and to enable our students and teachers to return to work. Uh, we quickly realized that uh, we uh, should not let this uh, fear, which I mentioned before, paralyze us. So returning to the educational and work process was the first step to restore our normal lifestyle and to show everyone that uh, we are really strong. So it was not only for the educational process, but for more wide um, reasons. And of course, the first months of studying uh, took place exclusively in an online form as a significant number of our teachers and students uh, were uh, and are still uh, abroad. Um, and of course, uh, it is important to emphasize that this really creates significant risks of brain drain. And uh, we can have a negative impact not only in, uh, at the university level, but also at the uh, national level of this issue and this problem. Uh, therefore, of course, uh, it is important for us that our students and teachers use opportunities for their own development uh, and security and uh, gain valuable experience, including in, in foreign uh, higher education institutions. But at the same time, uh, it is critical uh, for us uh, that our students and faculty maintain their connection uh, with the university and their connection with uh, Ukraine. And uh, it is quite obvious that online uh, learning, of course, um, could not and cannot qualitatively replace uh, live communication between teachers and students. So the risks of uh, online learning, in particular, the decline in the quality of the educational process due to the remote learning format are still a uh, pressing issue. Uh, fortunately, fortunately uh, we gradually managed to change uh, the learning format uh, from fully remote to mixed one. And uh, from the beginning, uh, since, since the beginning of uh, this winter, we uh, did that. And uh, uh, at the moment, lectures uh, at the university are held in um, online format, while seminars are held in the classes. Uh, of course, uh, security challenges uh, have been and remain the biggest problem of our time, uh, which we cannot uh, strictly influence because there is not a single safe place in Ukraine today, even, uh, even in our region. And this is a new reality we unfortunately have to, to live in and to understand. Uh, however, we uh, didn't give up hope for returning to the full education process as soon as possible. So since the beginning of the war, we have tried to create all the conditions for our students, teachers and staff to return to the university and to solve all uh, these uh, problems mentioned uh, before. To, to this end, we have arranged uh, missile um, shelters in the basements of the university uh, and during the air alarms, all students and employees of the university go down to the shelter and stay there 
until uh, the danger passes and uh, in, in some uh, situations uh, the lectures or seminars uh, continue even during these alarms but uh, in, in these um, uh, shelters. Uh, we also um, were predicted a difficult winter and it is true that um, the winter has become a real test of strength for all of us and the situation um, was significantly uh, aggravated by constant blackouts caused by uh, extensive damage to critical and energy infrastructure across uh, the country as a result of constant uh, shelling by, by Russia. And uh, it was really challenging to ensure an uh, interrupted educational process, even with online tools, when the electricity was provided only for four hours per day and the internet and mobile connection were mm, uh, unstable. Uh, but uh, when our students passed the winter session, despite the lack of electricity in our master's students successfully defended their master's thesis by uh, candlelight, uh, we were once again convinced that, that uh, we are not working in vain. And uh, now, of course, we, we uh, passed this very hard uh, period and uh, now the whole world understand that uh, this tactic of, of uh, Russia was not successful. Uh, after all, our main strength now is our human resource, and we understand this, and with such talented, inspired, and ideological young people, Ukraine will undoubtedly uh, have a bright future, but uh, much more to do in difficult moments. It is important to feel that we we are not fighting alone, and in our darkest moments, we have felt the truly unprecedented support of uh, the international community, our colleagues and partners who have helped to ensure the uninterrupted education process, including through the purchase of genera uh, generators, uh, financial assistance, and the constant support we have been feeling from the first day of the war until now, and of course, uh, we are very grateful to our colleagues from Charles University, from uh, other partners from uh, Eastern uh, Partnership uh, Cluster, and um, we sincerely appreciate the contribution of each and everyone who have contributed to the support of the, this uninterrupted education process at, at Lviv University. Uh, of course, uh, going through such an experience is difficult, both um, physically and mentally. And now you maybe you may hear the next siren just just in, uh, in just to, in this moment. So um, this experience allowed us to be flexible and uh, creative. In our daily work, we learned to use tools that we had never used before. And this year has demonstrated, first of all, to ourselves that we are capable of much more than we could even imagine, especially when we stand united uh, in solidarity. So looking back, I want to believe that the most difficult challenges are behind us, but regardless of what the future holds this year has given us confidence in our own strengths. So now we have no plan B, we only have plan A, to win and rebuild the free, independent, and successful Ukraine and successful Europe. So thank you, dear colleagues, very much for your attention. Now we have to go and organize this shelter process for our students with this siren. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, Vice Rector. This really is, uh, is something that makes me Okay, it, it makes for me very difficult to go back uh, to discussing academic procedures, but as I wrote to you when we were planning your participation in this uh, workshop, it might seem um, sort of strange to organize these uh, academic discussions, but as we all believe that uh, the final victory and the rebuilding of Ukraine is is something to to come very fast, we are doing our best, at least here in uh, in Central Europe, to prepare for this future. So, uh, 
I hope, I hope we will really be able to, to assist you. And God bless you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I, now, I now open the general discussion to the four, four interventions and the whole idea, because, because this first round table was supposed to be really the, the opening opening uh, uh, part of our workshop, so we should, we should be able to identify uh, the common, common problems uh, to, to, to be discussed. There were already some being mentioned, be it the PhD studies, which is, of course, the whole idea of PhD studies is a bit, bit anomalous because it's always a there is always a vacillation between the status of student and of researcher, even though we already agreed that the whole idea of a student is under transformation now. So we have this, this, this problem of the PhD studies and PhD research career. We have the problem of the organization of undergraduate studies, the standard system of semesters, which is, however, not so standard because some universities have trimesters, some universities have, have uh, the school year in a different way. So the competency-based approach, the outcome-based approach, approach might really be something that uh, that can bring bring new new possibilities for this we have the problem of the of the uh, recognition the problem of the of the, uh, the uh, uh, of the translation of the of the uh, uh, grades, which is which is something that we need to discuss, and we have also the the problem of the whole new virtual tools as the uh, and and all the questions I mentioned now, the problem of recognition, of course, with virtual learning, it's something to be taken into account. And we not only should be discussing this, but maybe, you know, we can already plan for future cooperation within uh, European in, uh, Eastern Partnership University cluster and outside of it, you know, how, how are we going to proceed? Uh, is the you know uh, the continuation maybe in smaller groups in focused groups of IRO officers or of the university representatives in these topics? So I'm opening the discussion now. Yeah, please, Bernie. Maybe I start, and uh, I would like to start with some questions just to understand correctly what my left neighbour said. <laughs> Um, about the um, um, grading uh, system that you integrated into Erasmus agreements, is that what I understood? Okay. Um, yes. Well, we uh, at department level or faculty level, because we are an inter multidisciplinary institution, uh, we have. Um, well, each department or faculty, according to the study program, has uh, its own like conversion scale, and uh, they put it online for the students to be available. When it comes to the green mobility, uh, it's a little bit different, and the the process is more complex, and so uh, we. We do, uh, when we uh, write down the uh, partnership agreement or the agreement uh, uh, among partners, we discuss and we put in the agreement uh, what kind of conversion scale we want to use. And we, we, will, we try also to avoid discrimination between the degree mobility and uh, the uh, study mobility because sometimes uh, we have to pay attention because if it's uh, um, a program uh, that has already uh, like uh, uh, Erasmus uh, partnership, study mobility mm -hmm. partnership, so there is already like a conversion scale, we have to pay attention and not to make like a uh, discrimination mm -hmm. between the, the two types of mobility. So technically, are you using the ECTS grading scale, the ABCD grading uh, scale? Yes, uh, even if no. the ACB <laughs> is not available anymore. So we use it when it's outside the no, European Union, you know, when we have, uh, for example, partners that are not really familiar with the ECTS. Uh, you know, Asia, for example, and she, she's, uh, she's the head of, of the office, so she can give more <laughs> details about this. Can give more details yeah, about something. that. 
uh, we thought to adhere to the agreements, of course, because in Europe it was a tool launched to, to solve the problem of um, grace conversion. If you know very well, it's very difficult to, to work with this instrument because it takes too much time to collect all the data. And uh, thought we have all, uh, all registered, and uh, there is a technician that must uh, uh, is, say, take all the data for each uh, uh, degree study, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. So, uh, we had decided to uh, go by ourselves to work for every agreement, not for Erasmus, because Erasmus has, uh, it's uh, going on for many years, and so that there is no need to check uh, every, every grade. But uh, since we work with other countries outside Europe, uh, and uh, um, they are particular with grade conversion. So we work on grade conversion with our partners, and of course also, also with um, double joint degrees. And since we are uh, ISO certified, we must, we must show what we are doing. So in the agreement, we put uh, everyone, perhaps also you do so, of course, um, we put a conversion table, not uh, the, not with the ECTS grades because they they are being abolished. I, I ask Professor Isaac that I greet with, with <laughs> pleasure. I remember her when we collaborated together. Hello, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and we ask our partner not to use any more E, A, B, C, D, A, because they do not correspond uh, well, because we have a, a, a scale in, in Italy that goes from 18 to 30. It's so difficult with, with Czechia and with Poland. And our partner in Poland, they say, oh, I would like to have this grade converted in uh, not 25, 27, please, no. <laughs> Tell us what we say, 27. No, but I prefer 25 to 27. Okay. Take this. <laughs> That's all on my part. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, and then, then yeah, B Bernie? I wanted to add something. Yeah, no, got I it? saw her hand waving. I don't know. You wanted to add something to that? Cathy, uh, did, you, did you want to add something to this? No, no. Uh, well, I, I, I can add something, or I don't know. Anyway, hello, Monica, <laughs> from my alma mater in Milan. Um, no, it, it, it has, as you know, been a very contentious because, in fact, in different countries, it's not just that we have different numbers in our grading systems, but there are also different philosophies and practices uh in different countries and the grading takes place in a different kind of a mental framework in some cases how high can the student get in others how can we how, how can the student be tested on that date and what they succeeded in doing so the grade actually means different things but in the current user's guide which is obligatory for the ehea at least and rightly Milan poses the problem of when you have to deal with other parts of the world, but the idea is that you do show the distribution of the actual grades that you do you do have and that the partner does the same and that you try to find a correspondence. And of course, in you give the student normally the benefit of the doubt if the boxes are too big. In the case of Italy, the boxes are very small but there are usually a lot of grades in the same boxes. In other countries, the boxes are fewer, so you have to try to match them. But that is as where we are today. There has not yet been a better, a better solution found, and it doesn't have the A, B, C, D, and so forth. 
Yeah, and I, I think I, I can add that it's also the problem of actually what you um, uh, what you uh, um, count within the grade, which again uh, is very relevant now when we talk about virtual uh, virtual study, because uh, the standard model of student coming to school and actually being graded for what he or she does at school. At, at, the, at the aula, it's now transformed because of uh, such a great amount of, of uh, independent work. So how, how do you, and the collaborative work with, with other students. So this is also something that need, uh, I think uh, this, is, this is something that really needs to be taken into account, especially if we are doing these, uh, these joint degrees or collaborative courses or shared courses. This is something that was not yet mentioned because there is a scale between joint degree and the shared courses. We know it within 4EU+, the, the whole project of shared courses, which, uh, which really is a way actually to smooth the ends I think it's a good start because on the on the example of shared courses and this is also something that we have been doing with our with our partners in Ukraine and in other in other uh, countries uh, trying to offer the shared courses the virtual shared courses also to their students but it needs to be very specifically stated in the description of the course uh, so that it can be then translated also into the, so that the, the students get full recognition for his or her participation in the course. You know, so, so I think this is something that, and uh, Bernie mentioned something about academics being, of course, uh, interested in the content of their courses, but the academics sometimes, uh, and I can, uh, I can acknowledge it from my previous career as academic, are, are not so much interested in those bureaucratic obstacles. And I think it's, it's really important uh, uh, that the university administration and the faculty administration uh, explains why this is so important. And why this is, especially because uh, it's different if you have a group of students from your own university where the rules are very clear. But in the moment you include, you include students visiting from elsewhere, and it's so easy now to have visitors online, then you need to be very careful so that the students after a semester or a year of hard work get a full recognition. So I think this is, this is something that we all need to bear in mind. Okay, but I don't want to occupy, occupy the field. So uh, other questions also, of course, from the audience, if you ask a question, please state your, state your um, affiliation and your area of interest. Um, okay, uh, if, if not, may I have a question on Bernie, uh, on more, to, to, to um, clarify more, because of course you gave the example of the, of the chemistry at the outcomes of, at the, at the chemistry field. Uh, do you really think this is applicable to, let's say, medical sciences or, because I know there have been some discussions now about the organization of, of medical studies, because it's, it's, it's uh, a field that's also under full development. So you, uh, have you, have you tried, uh, this, this approach also in other, other areas? I think it is applicable. Of course, I have not applied it myself because I'm not involved in medical studies. Um, our department at Sorbonne University was the pilot department for that, so this is why it's done in chemistry. Uh, the idea was to generalize it uh, later on, and uh, at the moment uh, we are working on that. So I think it's applicable. I think in all different disciplines, fields of studies, and so on, you can identify or you can cluster um, competences together and put uh, those modules into these groups. A competency cluster, as I call it, is just a group of different modules that are teaching and learning the, about the same outcomes. And so I think in, in all different fields, you can find uh, these groups. They are not always by the number of four. It happens that in our case it was four. You might find two or three or five or seven. Shouldn't be too many because then it gets a little bit complicated. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, as we are a bit running out of time uh, as to our schedule, I will now... Um, 
say goodbye to for for this one hour to our online guests i'm really sorry but this is really the disadvantage of virtual virtual mobilities that we can't invite you for lunch uh, so uh, you will just you know have to think of us when you have your own in your homes and we will meet uh, we will meet online and also here in this room in uh, exactly 55 minutes uh, at quarter to two to continue our discussion with the second second keynote which will be which will be given by um, uh, 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 by uh, by um, Jan Mael Bidot from the European Commission on a Bologna Process and Joint Degrees. So we will continue precisely this discussion on joint degrees. So thank you for the moment and uh, see you see you soon.
colleagues, uh, distinguished guests. guests. Uh, I hope you're uh, all enjoying the workshop uh, so far. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to open the second section, uh, which will focus on the joint and double degrees. I'm pleased uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Jan Merl Bede, uh, policy officer of the Higher Education Unit of the European Commission, who will speak on the Bologna process and joint degrees. Uh, following the keynote address, we will move on to our second round table, uh, where we have the following speakers. Uh, Professor Miroslava Lendel, Vice Rector for International Affairs from Ujgorod National University, and uh, uh, Mrs. Monica Sinibaldi from the International Relations Office of the University of Milan. Uh, we are honored to have you all uh, with us today to share your insights and experiences. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Boudin, and uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask you to kindly confirm if you ca can hear and see us clearly, Mr. Boudin. Yes, perfectly. Thank you so much. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for the invitation. I have the very hard task uh, to come right after your, your lunch break. So I hope uh, I will manage to, to keep your, your attention with my presentation. I was asked to um, deliver a keynote on the Bologna process and, and joint degrees. And you may uh, know that at European level, uh, the joint degree programs are uh, nowadays quite high on the agenda, and I will touch upon uh, what we have been doing recently around uh, joint degree programs at European uh, level, at the EU level, more specifically. So uh, before we dive into um, what uh, joint programs and how they're developed, uh, I think one, one important thing is to, to clearly define where we are talking about what is a joint program, what is a joint degree, what is a joint degree program, because these three things are, uh, uh, well, cover different different uh, aspects of, of uh, sometimes the, um, an educational journey, basically. So a joint program is an educational program that has been developed, that is offered together by um, different institutions, uh, at least two, and uh, most of the times from uh, different countries. Now, this joint program at the end can lead to the award of a joint degree. The joint degree being one single diploma, one single document that is issued together by institutions of different countries. It can also, a joint program can also lead to the award of uh, what we call multiple degrees, uh, meaning a double degree. So that's when the students receive two uh, diploma at the end, one from institution A from country A and one from institution B in country B. Or as in some cases, it can lead to, uh, the joint program can lead to the award or even more degrees. Uh, that's what we call the multiple degrees, three, four, depending on the number of partners that are involved. I think um, we have seen in the last year an explosion at European level of uh, the offering of joint educational programs. And uh, in a way, it reflects uh, very much what the Bologna process, uh, the European higher education area do the best, meaning bringing together uh, institutions, allow them to be so compatible in their practices, in their legal, uh, in the legal framework they are evolving with, that they can jointly offer educational programs to students who can then benefit from what uh, universities, what e higher education institutions have the best to offer. Uh, having two institutions from two different countries offering to one single student what they do the best. And we have seen a clear tendency for uh, this uh, development of joint educational programs um, across Europe. The European Union has been uh, supporting them. Uh, what for? Because they have been, this joint educational program, they have been identified 
with clear benefits, not only uh, for the students, but also for the institutions that offer them. Um, here is, uh, are the 10 most frequently identified benefits for uh, transnational partnerships, meaning joint uh, educational programs between higher education institutions that were formed by the Joint Research Center of the European Union in 2018. So uh, the identified benefits were that it improves the internationalization profile of the institutions delivering them. Uh, they improve the student skills. They improve the uh, and diversify educational offering of participating institutions. They of course increase the mobility of student staff, but they also increase the student employability, which uh, can be linked with the improved student skills. They increase the number of foreign students that institutions are able to attract, um, increase the level of scientific excellence, uh, the number of interdisciplinary research, capacity of teaching staff and research skills. So all in all, we can say that joint educational programs not only benefit students, but also institutions, employers who can benefit from a very skilled uh, labor and trained uh, force and research uh, capacities of institution by extension society. That's why the, at the European Union level we have been supporting the um, development delivery of joint educational programs starting about 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago with the Erasmus Mundus Joint Masters, which is a funding scheme of the, of the European Union. Since 2004, it's about 600 Erasmus Mundus Joint Masters programs that were funded uh, through the Erasmus Plus program. Um, they are master's programs that are delivered by at least uh, three institutions uh, from three different countries in Europe and beyond. And they offer high level scholarships to excellent students worldwide. It's a great way to attract uh, foreign students uh, to uh, your institution while um, developing a cooperation with partners from the EU, from Europe and beyond. Now, delivering, implementing a joint master's program is one thing, but all the work that leads toward the preparation uh, of, this, uh, of this program needs also to be taken into account and supported. And that's why since 2021, we have one new uh, funding uh, measure, which is the Erasmus design measure uh, that support the design of the uh, high level study program at master level uh, of joint master's programs. So this is not about the implementation, but more about the preparation, the design of the joint master's program that then can eventually be funded uh, by the Erasmus Mundus scheme or uh, by any other uh, scheme. That was for the master's level. For the doctoral uh, level, we also have the Maris Grodowska Curie European Joint Doctorate Network that have uh, been funded since 2014. We have 60, 77 of them that have been funded, which implies more than 1,200 individual fellowships. And these lead to the delivery of joint double multiple doctoral degrees between participating institutions. Now, the latest uh, initiative that supports the delivery uh, and implementation of joint programs is the European University Alliance, uh, Alliances that uh, at the moment we speak are uh, about four, 44 European University Alliances, a group of institutions that involve together more than 300 of them that are for uh, main objective to design and implement together educational programs and other activities. And we can expect from all these institutions evolve the in gradual design implementation of hundreds of new joint programs in all cycle, uh, bachelor, masters and doctoral programs. What we have to, to, to think about when we're talking about a joint educational program as well is that um, th thinking of transnational cooperation as a bilateral cooperation between institution A and B 
between institution B located in two different countries is certainly important. Uh, but more and more, we are, seeing, we are seeing the development of much wider framework for cooperation. And the European University alliances are, are one example. Uh, we need to see more and more transnational cooperation in Europe uh, involving more partners, involving more uh, countries, meaning involving <laughs> more and more different uh, legal uh, legislative frameworks, uh, administrative cultures. And that needs to be, uh, that calls for a, an action uh, at European and at national levels to make sure that we are not putting obstacles on the way of the development of joint transnational educational offers. We already have at European level, and thanks to the uh, Bologna process, the European higher education area, we have some what we call enablers. So some tools, some instruments that were designed and agreed on with the objective to uh, make different legislation compatible and make this kind of offering possible. So when it comes to the information on the uh, qualification, we have obviously uh, the European qualification framework. We have uh, the qualification framework for the European higher education area. Uh, quality assurance is an essential element uh, when it comes to uh, develop and implement joint educational programs. And there we have standard and guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education area. We have the Descartes database. We have the, the European approach for quality assurance of joint programs. We have many things, uh, of course, touching upon transparency of learning outcome, the use of ECTS and diploma supplements come here very handy to have a common recognition of, of, uh, of the, 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 the learning outcome the students have achieved. And when it comes to recognition of qualification, we of course have the NARIC network, uh, the Council recommendation on automatic recognition of qualifications and Europass digital credential infrastructure. So we have many tools, many instruments that can support um, institutions to develop joint educational programs. But we also are very much aware that there are many, many obstacles on the way. Uh, whenever an institution sets itself on the way toward uh, developing a joint program, and especially a joint degree program with another partner, there are many obstacles along the way. Uh, these obstacles can be legal, administrative obstacles to set up joint programs, activities. For example, uh, one country wouldn't have in its legislation that um, classes can only take place in the national language. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense uh, when, when uh, considering national programs, but in the context of transnational cooperation, uh, one can easily see how that could be become a problem when it will come to accredit a, a transnational joint program that will, in most of the case, be at least uh, biling be bilingual or have some parts taking place in another language. The award of a joint degree that what I referred uh, earlier to the a single diploma uh, is also uh, an obstacle that is very often faced uh, by institutions involved in the delivery of transnational programs. Um, sometimes it's because of, uh, of rules that can be seen as minor as, for example, one country would have planned in its legislation that the diploma needs to be printed in a certain place uh, by a, a certain uh, printing uh, printing uh, infrastructure that has been designated by law as the only one allowed to print the diploma. Of course, that would create a problem in case of uh, transnational cooperation or the fact that some uh, persons are the only ones that can sign a diploma. Uh, we have uh, the case of diploma, for example, that needs to be signed by the king of the country and only the king of the country. Well, in the context of transnational cooperation, if another country has in its legislation that another appointed person needs to sign this document, you can very well imagine how this creates uh, 
uh, an administrative obstacle to the award of, of the joint program. And of course, the more partners you have, the more different legislation you have, and you have to compile and find a way to make them compatible, unless uh, you go through multiple accreditation procedures, multiple quality assurance procedures, and multiple award degree at the end. We see, even though we have the Bologna tools, they are not evenly implemented at national level. Some implement them fully, some implement them partially, uh, some implement some instruments fully and others only partially. And that creates um, something that is not a level playing field. Not everyone has access to the same uh, kind of, of support. And of course, uh, there is also the, the difficulty uh, that it is always difficult to mutualize uh, strengths, uh, share joint resources when it comes to financial resources, human resources, uh, services uh, that are needed for the implementation of our joint program. This is more an obstacle at institutional level, a funding obstacle as well. So that's why um, last year, um, <clears throat> the Council of the, of the European Union uh, adopted a recommendation uh, that has the title of Building Bridges for Effective European Higher Education Cooperation, in which the Council gives the recommendation to the Member States to make it easier for higher education institutions engaged in transnational cooperation to provide joint programs and award joint degrees in accordance with the Bologna instruments. Because, of course, the objective is to build on what has already been done on the Bologna instrument that are very relevant and to widen their use. In this context, um, the, the, the recommendation also recommends uh, the member states to examine and facilitate the delivery of new potential instruments that could be a joint European degree label and later on, possibly um, joint degrees uh, based on common uh, European criteria. And the recommendation continues by giving a recommendation not to the member states, but to the European Commission, uh, again, to uh, look into the development of these two instruments, starting with uh, the joint European degree label. And it asks the European Commission to pilot uh, as from 2022 or so as from its adoption, the development and implementation of criteria that could lead to the award of joint European degree label that would have, uh, that would build on the Bologna instruments and boost their implementation. And at a later stage, uh, once this uh, will have been done, uh, the, the, the European Commission is asked to report to the Council to uh, look at what other steps could be taken toward possible joint degrees uh, based on the same European criteria in accordance always, as it is stressed, with the instruments of the Bologna process. So the key features of this uh, possible joint degree on creative criteria that would come at the end of the road and for which there is at this stage, no certainty that needs to be to be analyzed. Uh, what is very clear is that the uh, award of degrees uh, is a competence of the member states, and it's not a competence of the European Union. So whatever comes uh, as a result at the end will not be awarded by a European body, but still by national authorities. The aim is not to create new type of degrees that would replace national degrees or joint degrees. The aim is more to create a common framework that can be used if the member states wants to use it as sort of a, uh, one could see it as a Bologna process package uh, where all these different uh, instruments are brought together and uh, are 
through a label or through the degree made consistently applied for at least uh, the degrees developed in a transnational cooperation context. So we have launched uh, this pilot initiative uh, and the, the, the result, uh, I mean, we have launched a call for participation, we have received applications and announced the result in January. Now the activities will start uh, later this month or the next one. And the, we have about a hundred higher education institutions in Europe and national authorities of nearly all member states uh, that will be involved in the testing of um, a list of criteria that have been drafted that could lead to a label for, for joint European degree programs. Now, the point of this piloting is to ask higher education institutions and member states to look at these criteria and tell us whether they can be optimized, uh, whether some need to be removed, some need to be added, and elaborate proposals to facilitate the development and the implementation of joint degrees in Europe, uh, including what could be an approach for the delivery of joint degrees in Europe based on common European criteria. So these are the three objectives of the piloting project that uh, will start uh, toward the end of this month and will run for one year, after which uh, we hope that we'll have very, um, very complete um, conclusions that the European Commission will analyze and make propositions to the member states. What we see as an added value of the first step, the joint European degree label, would be for institutions and member states, it could help to increase the visibility of the joint programs that are not always as visible as they could be, um, to attract more EU and international students uh, in the institution that are offering this kind of, of, of programs, which goes along with visibility and facilitate uh, transnational cooperation, support the removal of what we call the, the red tape for joint programs, support the removal of obstacles for the delivery of such programs. At EU level, what we see as uh, potential benefits is the uh, increasing the competitiveness and reputation of the European higher education area, deepen it, uh, boost the implementation of the Bologna tools, which is a key goal of, of these instruments and enhance deeper cooperation among different institutions. I'm not going to go through uh, all the different criteria that we have developed uh, and that are proposed to institutions to, to test, uh, but uh, if you are interested in to, uh, you can easily have access to them. I think there is nothing revolutionary in these criteria. Uh, most of them are already applied for programs such as Erasmus Mundus or Maris Klodowska Curie Actions, but they are just brought together as a consistent package that to, can be applied to all disciplines and to all, all levels, bachelor, master's, doctoral programs. So it's about having at least two higher education institutions involved from two different countries, uh, having a, a joint degree delivered at the end of the uh, study program, the use of the ECTS, the use of uh, recognized quality assurance arrangements uh, through the um, European Quality Assurance Registry uh, assurance um, assurances that have joint policies for the joint program, which means you agree on what students you take, uh, you select in, in your joint program and how you will uh, organize the courses, the examinations, offering transnational access to the campus, to the students that will be part of these uh, transnational programs, having embedded some student mobility arrangements, uh, which can be physical uh, and also can be thought as maybe also digital, at least having the possibility to have that the use of uh, multilingualism where possible and relevant, uh, the use of innovative learning approaches, uh, the monitoring of a and some um, 
um, commitment to promote inclusiveness and to sustainability through the implementation of the program. In this criteria, we use all these different uh, higher European higher dictionary Bologna instruments uh, that we have tried to compile into one. So there you will find the use of the European qualification framework, the use of the standard guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education area, uh, the European quality assurance register for the uh, quality assurance agencies involved in the quality assurance processes, the European approach for quality assurance of joint programs where relevant, the use of the ECTS and diploma supplements to um, show the learning outcome of the students. So this will be an exciting uh, way uh, to explore and it's a step-by-step -step approach. Now we are at the beginning. We have basically drafted a list of criteria that institutions will have to look at and give us feedback on together with national authorities because national authorities are the ones uh, who can, uh, who have the final say in this. That will last for one year. In 2024 and beyond, what will be important is to analyze the results of these pilots, see whether indeed it makes sense to go for a joint European degree label and or if this label could actually be used to um, promote change in national legislation to make it easier for each national legislation to allow for the development of joint programs and the award of joint degrees at the end of joint programs. Uh, we believe that it can also serve as a good um, example or roadmap for countries who are looking into what they need to enable in their own national legislation in order for the institutions to be able to uh, get more involved in the development and delivery of joint educational programs. And it can help also to put the finger on some specific things that were not necessarily thought as an obstacle to transnational cooperation when they were uh, when they were decided, but turned out to be a, a major obstacle, creating a lot of uh, of, uh, of trouble for the institution that want to have a more active uh, internationalization strategy. So this will be it for me. I think I stick to my time and. Uh, I don't know if there is time for any question. Thank you very much. Dear Mr. Bidem, uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. And now I'm opening the discussion parts uh, after the few, uh, first lecture. And first of all, I would like to ask our online participants if they have some questions related to joint degrees programs. No, if we uh, do not have questions from our online participants, I would like to ask our uh, participants uh, in the auditorium uh, for the questions. And please, uh, Mr. Uh, Bernald, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Uh, you mentioned very clearly the different problems that have the joint degrees, and um, you also pointed out what I think is uh, one of the sources and uh, the competencies that are only on the member states, uh, not like in research where we have a shared competency, there's no comp competency on the European level. Maybe at one point we might have also a shared competency on the educational uh, level. But that's just a personal comment. Um, for the European degree label, uh, just a short question. Do you think we should have only one European degree label at the end of this process? Or do you think there might be several European degree label, labels with, who are, depending on the criteria, some of the labels are for some criteria and others for other criteria? Uh, I think uh, at the end of the piloting phase, uh, the, the, the objective was certainly to have one label uh, for all programs. Uh, it's also a matter of making it uh, more 
understandable for people who will be confronted to the label so they know what it means if if we end up having different labels for um, different purposes then the the visibility of the label might be lost and then it, its power uh, and the way it can promote change might be might be might be weakened uh, what we have tried at least from from the the commission side with the list of criteria is really to try to be the least specific uh, as possible when it comes to different uh, level so we know that okay, it, it's quite easy to come uh, to come up with some common criteria for bachelor and master's programs they are often organized in the same way uh, but it's harder when it comes to finding common criteria for bachelor and doctoral programs for example so in the list of criteria um, there are actually some sub criteria that are more adapted to doctoral uh, programs uh, in some cases for example uh, i know we have uh, a criteria on the on the use of ECTS to measure uh, how long the mobility should be, what we say in the, uh, we say that there should be at least one period of mobility in the program. And when it comes to bachelor and master's students, we say it, it should represent at least 30 ECTS because we wanted it to, to be more or less a, a semester. Uh, but we know that we cannot use as a criteria for doctoral programs. So there, we went for, there should be a mobility of at least six months. So there are some kind of adaptations that have been made uh, here and there to distinguish between doctoral programs and bachelor and master's program. But all in all, they, they all have the same reasoning behind. It's just a matter of translating it into uh, practical criteria. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, do we have another one? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I would like to follow up on what uh, you mentioned uh, last year, example with the mobilities, because I was, I was wondering about this. It follows up with what we were talking about in the morning. Of course, I can understand the logic behind this, that uh, mobility will be an obligatory part of any joint or double degree. But on the other hand, it might be the limiting limiting uh, factor because it is of course very demanding for the students to move in the course especially for the undergraduate students because the masters especially on the masters level uh, the the time period is really very short so and following up what professor isaacs was telling us about the uh, international experience at home that should be uh, part of the everyday life of every university wouldn't you, wouldn't you consider uh, a possibility of, let's say, moving professors around instead of moving students? You know, really making, uh, making the, the, the experience international by this way, because actually I'm also following up with, with the early modern tradition of professors going from one university to another. And, and which would also mean that also other students, not only those enrolled in those specific double degree or joint degree programs would, would experience this. But, and now I will speak not as a visionary, but as someone from the university management, of course, the uh, mobility of professors is actually much more administratively demanding than mobility of students. You know the famous A1, A1 uh, form, and all the all those obstacles. So, are you taking all, also this into consideration when implementing this European uh, degree label? Is there a chance for, let's say, uh, relaxation of procedures or setting up easier administrative procedures for uh, making also the mobility of professors uh, more more uh, easy? Thank you. Indeed, this is. Uh, a discussion we had uh, when we are preparing the list of criteria, uh, how to reflect the fact that staff also is moving between the different institutions, moving or offering their programs uh, through digital means. And um, for that, you have to uh, 
um, consider that it, the, this list of criteria was not, it's not really a first draft, the what that is proposed to be tested. Uh, we had a first draft that we run pass through um, different stakeholder organizations uh, representing higher education sector, the students, and also the member states. And there, what we heard uh, very strongly from um, student organizations, uh, also member states, is that they were preferring to have a criteria on physical mobility and the rest okay, could be added to it, but as optional, optional criteria. Um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the list of criteria uh, that uh, is proposed to be tested, we have a list of what we propose to be mandatory criteria. And in mobility, you will find this 30 CTS mobility for uh, bachelor or uh, master student I was referring to. And then in the optional criteria, we had a criteria saying, in addition to physical mobility, uh, the drone program includes additional formats of transnational learning activities with partners, for example, online or blended uh, courses, or the, the, the fact that, uh, or staff mobility uh, to have teach uh, the fact that uh, in the drone program, there are courses that are delivered in the home institution by a professor coming from another institution. But there we were told that we might be going too far into defining criteria, that we, we might take the risk to become too specific and uh, too restrictive in there. Uh, what's also important to keep in mind is that for the physical mobility, uh, the criteria is at the level of the program. And it doesn't say that the student has to each that every and each student needs to go on physical mobility for 30 CTS. It says that the program includes uh, the possibility for the students to go abroad physically for 30 CTS. And there, I think we try to find a balance between the fact that physical mobility seemed to be uh, the preferred format uh, of, of mobility by, by many actors, but also they are and you're right, there are some, some people, some learners who cannot go on physical mobility because they have uh, different constraints, but that should not prevent them from participating to a, a program awarded with this label, for example. So here we are still at the, at the beginning of the process. Now institutions will look again at this list of criteria and they will indeed maybe come up with some proposals to expand them to other formats of, of mobility, uh, modify this criteria on mobility arrangements, include staff mobility among the criteria again. And of course, if that's the, the lessons from the pilots, then we will take it into account in the, in the analysis that we will then uh, make public and, and, and offer the different member states to reflect on. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question from Katharine Reinhardt, University of Heidelberg. Thank you. Um, I have got a question regarding the PhD, uh, planned PhD programs. Are you planning, like out of our experience, um, uh, mobility of PhD uh, has to be as flexible as possible? And you were talking about, if I correctly understood, six months of mobility within the program, but um, are you planning to keep it rather flexible, like short-term mobilities and so on? So um, it's not a certain, like it's not defined or... Yeah, no, that's yeah, also that's another, another another point we, we reflected upon. We wanted to make sure that the, the criteria on mobility is sort of uh, comparable between the, the, the different programs, but we're also very much aware that PhDs are very uh, specific. And that's why in the criteria, uh, what we say is that the drone program includes a total of at least six months of physical mobility at another institution. And that includes a secondment. And then there is a little, uh, there is a, a, a little note, uh, a little footnote that says the total six months mobility period can be the sum 
the sum of several shorter mobility periods. So you can combine shorter mobility periods to make it uh, a total of, of six months. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, once again, Mr. Bidder, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you for much. Th thank you so much for your participation during our event. And, and now uh, we are moving to the second round table uh, of the event. Um, and uh, it is my pleasure to invite uh, Her Magnificence, Madam Vice Rector Miroslava Lendel, and ask her to uh, present her topic. Uh, which is connected with the challenge of the double degree program with uh, the participation of Ukraine institutions. Uh, Madam Vice Rector, the screen is yours. Madam Vice Rector, we cannot hear you. Uh, can you un unmute? Yes, sorry. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Good afternoon, dear colleagues from the Charles University, dear colleagues from Ukraine, from Ukrainian universities. And I am so impressed to be invited to this event and to take part in discussion and to present my view on the challenges of double degree uh, programs in uh, Ukrainian universities. One technical question, can I ask to present uh, my presentation on your screen because I'm not sure about the stable connection because we have missile attack now in Ukraine. So it will be very good for me that you will present my presentation on your screen. And I will just tell what is going on, if it is possible, of course. Did you send the presentation uh, before? Yes, yes. Uh, Do you see my presentation it? now? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So, so we will we will share okay. we will share the presentation okay. in a minute. Okay. okay. I'm sorry because I'm not sure about the quality of the connections, but in case that something is missing, so I will just tell what is going on. So the topic of my presentation is the challenge of the double degree programs with the participation of Ukrainian institutions. And I want to start a little bit about the history of our experience of the education, internationalization and our approach uh, to the double degree programs. I want to start from the a uh, thesis that was uh, admitted by my colleague from Ivan Franco National University is that uh, this situation in Ukraine, this war situation, uh -huh. it's it's not, I'm sorry, it is not only about the existence of the Ukrainian universities, it is also about the new possibilities that are open before our universities. Maybe the only benefit from the Russian innovation to Ukraine is the opening of the European educational space for the for Ukrainian universities. Uh, last year, Ukraine was granted the status of the candidate of the EU, and from this time we uh, start to approach the education in Europe, the possibility to create the double degree or even joint degree, not as a parallel process as it was before the war. Uh, we uh, start to approach this issue as a necessity of our education. Uh, my colleague from Ivan Franco National University stressed that the challenge of the brain drain from Ukraine is one of the hot topics for our university. We uh, have, we are obliged to create the possibilities for our students that they can be the part of the European educational space staying in Ukraine. And we were preparing for the challenge even before the war because we understand all the problems, all the challenges uh, that were in the higher education of Ukraine before the war and it were in, inside of the universities. First of all, uh, about the statistics. In Ukraine, we have around 300 universities. 
more exactly, we have 282 universities. It is a st statistic of the June of the 2022. Currently, we are in the process when some universities are splitting, but we are really on the beginning of this process because our ministry and as well as our academia university communities, we are taking some democratic approach to the splitting of the university. And uh, this a big number of Ukrainian universities uh, created the situation of the competition uh, when we are uh, looking on the ranking of each other to attract students, to attract better professors, and of course, to establish the links of international partners. If we are speaking about my university, about the state university, Uzhgorod National University, uh, we belong to the second tenth of the uh, best Ukrainian uh, universities, and it is measured by several criteria. Uh, currently, we have more than 16,000 students in our ranks. It is the um, number measured during the fall of the last year, after the finish of the entrance uh, campaign. And we have uh, more than 1,052 employees. All our educational and research activities, they are made on uh, 108 departments that are structures in 18 faculties. I want to stress that two years ago, we started in our university, the, program of the splitting of the faculties, but it was stopped uh, because of the war and also because of the challenge that we want to understand how these interdisciplinary linkages are made in uh, European universities, uh, what are the demands from different stakeholders, from the business, from the economics, from the society to understand how to better to split our faculties and departments. And uh, all this made some structure of our educational process that we can propose for our partners, uh, the faculties and specialities, which are the better uh, from the demand from the Ukrainian uh, students. For our what um, specialities that are of the big demand from the Ukrainian students, of course, legal studies, international relations, medicine, we are the classical faculty, university that has medicine faculty in our structure. And the last year we witnessed a very interesting challenge, very interesting trend that many of our students are returning to the engineering specialties, construction, electronics, machine engineering, which were not very popular uh, before the COVID times. Uh, it was maybe it was challenged by the demands of the Ukrainian economy uh, that was recovering uh, from the crisis before the war. And we are sure that this trend uh, will be prolonged and during and after the war because our economy, our society, our ter territory will demand many people who will stay in economy, in industry, and rebuild our country after the war. Uh, before, before the COVID times, we tried to analyze what are the main problems of in the internationalization of our education. And we uh, understand that we have to make some ranking of the specialities that we can propose for the academic mobility and we can propose uh, for the double degree programs for our partners. Uh, I'm going to the next slide and to explain to you that we are looking on our education as education that is developing in the international environment. And we are using mostly for our internal assessment the data from the um, international ranks. Uh, all these ranks, of course, are familiar for you. And if you are uh, looking on our figure, we are, com we are comparing our university with other Ukrainian universities. Uh, we are instantly uh, 
belonging to the second tenth of the Ukraine and the universities by all these rankings. Uh, but if you look on the two last uh, rankings, it is Ugreen metric and Times Higher Education Impact. Uh, we belong to the, we are on the ninth place and we are on the third, seventh place between other Ukrainian universities. And we analyze this data and make such a conclusion that our interest, our stress to the engineering uh, specialities, also our interest to the topic of the sustainable development and the, to the topic of the um, uh, developing of the specialities who are demanded by our society, by different stakeholders, I raising the quality of education just on these specialities. So currently our stress is IT speciality, specialities which are developing in the field of the biology, geography, in the field of the sustainable development, and which are inheriting uh, other specialities that are most popular in our university. Also, we are trying to uh, combine our educational activities with a research. And this combination of the education and research are presented by the participation in different international projects. This is the main projects that are developing uh, by our university this year. And this is a big set of projects that are uh, develop under the Erasmus program, under the Horizon Euro program. Uh, you can see some projects that are funded by Jean Monnet, uh, European Commission program. And also we have a big stress of the energy and engineering uh, projects, which are supported by uh, different international donors. Uh, these projects are developing on around the specialities that have the best academics inside. And we also trying to involve students on the level of the PhD and master program to take part in these projects and to be ready to further uh, partnership with, uh, with the students in the different countries. Also, we are trying, uh, as was stressed by another speakers, to invite foreign professors from different countries inside our university to deliver maybe some lectures to make our students preparing for the internationalization. This approach is that you can create international environment inside the university is very valuable for Ukraine now because we are not able to uh, push many university uh, to students to go to Europe now because of many obstacles, but we are struggling to create the feeling uh, that, uh, that they are taking the benefits from the European education, from the best European professors when they are staying inside the university. About the mode of studies and the mode of the research, we are trying to combine in these days hybrid way of delivering of lectures. Some of our students are, are studying online, some of the students are studying offline, and we are trying to combine the best we can provide to our students. We are trying to use all these instruments that we developed and opened for Ukrainian universities by our international partners during these war months. For example, we have a very fruitful um, partnership with the University of Central Lancashire from United Kingdom that, were, is, that is supporting mm -hmm. by the twinning initiative between UK and Ukrainian government. And they, they opened us many virtual environments, open for us many open uh, virtual courses that we are delivering for our students. And it is very helpful for them to be prepared for the other forms of mobility. Uh, also, I can stress that this is uh, all organizations, international organizations that currently we are taking part in and we are 
looking on this participation in these structures as a way to receive some internal knowledge, some know-how, how to access the problem of the students' mobility and especially the problem and challenge of the double degree uh, development. And you can see that Eastern Partnership University cluster, you are our new partner, and we really appreciate all these possibilities that are open before us, uh, especially participation in this discussion. Uh, this slide, this diagram is uh, such short explanations of our main and the best partnerships that currently we have been. So if we uh, assess and we make the set of the countries that we have the biggest deal of the mobility, it is academic credit mobility, it is a semester study, youth exchange, and of course, double degree program. So the winners are the Italy, Czech Republic, uh, Romania, Croatia, uh, Poland, Slovak Republic, uh, Hungary, uh, and Lithuania. Uh, around 100 students of other university currently are in the universities of these countries. Uh, using the different most of studies. Uh, we appreciated much the possibility to use the virtual mobility because uh, currently, because of the martial war, uh, our uh, students who are men, they are not able to cross the border and to uh, visit our university's partners physically, but they can use virtual mobility to be in the equal uh, equal situation with the girl and women that are taking part in these programs. Uh, if we, we are speaking about the challenge and our good experience of the double degree cooperation with other universities, I want to stress that the last year already during the war, our university have a possibility to join very good master program and uh, master program um, cluster, uh, which is named Mathematics for Real World application. Uh, it is called a Cluster of Real Math, and this cluster is developed by several Ukrainian universities and European universities, and it is circled around the University of L'Aquila in Italy. Uh, due to this program, currently 10 students of the Faculty of Mathematics and Digital Technologies have the possibility to study uh, simultaneously at both universities. I want to stress that from our university, two girls are already in Italy physically and eight boys, they are virtually in our university, but they have chance to study with the uh, uh, with other students using the benefits of the virtual mobility. Uh, this program is comprised in a very smart way as for me, because master students of two specialities from our university, this is system analysis and applied mathematics. Uh, they can use the scheme that for, uh, during the first and the third semester, they are physically in Ujno, and uh, during the second and the fourth semester, they studied at the University of L'Aquila. Currently, I want to stress that girls are physically in the University of L'Aquila, and our students, boys, they are physically in Ujgorod, but they, are, they have access to the online en environment of the University of L'Aquila. Why this program is successful from our point of view? First of all, it was developed during the several years by other universities of Ukraine, by uh, Tara Shevchenko University from Kiev, uh, uh, by Ivan Franko National University from Lviv. And as far as I know from our colleagues uh, from these universities, it was a big uh, challenge to make the adaptation of the study programs from different universities. It was a big challenge to make such system of semesters uh, 
uh, linkages between Ukrainian and European uh, universities. And it was also a challenge uh, also to provide some financial support for Ukrainian students who are going to Italy for study. And University of L'Aquila find a program that is that, that is supporting Ukrainian students when they are staying in Italy. This is really a challenge for Ukrainian students uh, whose income is lower, maybe as European uh, counterpart, to find this support from the national government, from Erasmus or other program, European Commission, to support his or his study when he is in the uh, Europe. And we are trying to make such connections that all other you know, uh, students, nevertheless, of the income of the family will have a possibility to take this program if they have uh, academic criteria which are good for this program. I'm going to another good experience. And I want to stress that during the last year, nevertheless, that it was a war year for our university as well as for other Ukrainian universities, we were lucky to uh, make agreement about the double degree program with Pomeranian University in Slupsk in Poland. And this program is focused on the speciality diplomacy and foreign policy. Also, uh, we signed the agreement with Alexander Dubček University in Trenčín in Slovak Republic, and it is focused more on political science. And as well, uh, we proceed with our old program. This is program in software engineering and business analysis, which is made with School of Economics and Management in public administration in Bratislava, Slovak Republic. I want to stress that our experience is that it's better to make uh, double degree programs on master degree. Why this is better from the point of our university? Because my, maybe one of the reasons is that in Ukraine, a uh, master degree is one and a half or two years uh, prolongation, and it is a shorter time of study, and it is better to make the comparison of competences between European partner and Ukrainian partner. As well, on this uh, level, on the master degree, we have a better selection of students who are able to study both in English or in the national language of the country where they are going in. And also not the last thing that on the level of the master students, uh, we have a better motivation of students who are going to Europe, to our European partner, to take part uh, in the program when they know the competencies that they are looking for. Uh, the level of the motivation of master degree uh, students is higher for, from our side of for our point of view that on the level of the baccalaureate program. So our uh, such conclusion of our university is that our trend is to make these programs on the level of the master degree. But of course, doctoral program is just a next uh, stage of the, our interest and our international uh, development. Uh, currently preparing to this meeting and looking inside of other new partnerships that other universities started to participate in. This is a European uh, partnership uh, university cluster. This is also a twinning program with the university with central Lancashire. Also, we are invited to the uh, cluster of the European Green Universities. Also, we are taking part in some Erasmus competitions just in this spring months. We are looking to the potential of the new programs that we can provide to our universities as those programs that we can start some negotiations about the formation of the double degree programs. And on this slide, you can just look and see the our selections of our, our offer to our partners. Why we are looking on these specialities as interesting for our students and maybe interesting for our partners. 
for these seven uh, specialities, we can uh, provide the selections of the best students who have a good knowledge of English or other Central European mostly uh, languages. Also, we have, we have a good approach to the harmonization of different uh, competencies just on these specialities because we have experience of Erasmus mobilities on these specialities and we have uh, prepared staff in the faculty's office to prepare new programs, joint programs with the international partners. Also, we have feeling that our approach to European Union, uh, the access assessment of the Ukrainian ability to join the European Union, the accession to European Union that we are waiting for, uh, is creating demand in the uh, spe specialists who are fluent in the business communications, who is ready to work in the field in the, of the modern journalism, who are fluent in international business law, who have a good knowledge in international economic relations, and of course, who is ready to study in deep European studies. And, but uh, going back to slides, I want to stress that also we are making a big stress and are paying attention to creating of joint degree programs with specialities which are oriented on the IT field or also on engineering field. Of course, we are looking uh, that we have many challenges before us and we understand that we have to be prepared to adapt our programs uh, to the programs or to our, of our partners. We have to look for common language of assessment, of delivering of grades and to assessment of credits and of making of the academic records and other things that are around the double degrees. But we have motivation to do this because we are motivated by all our people who are now struggling in the east of Ukraine. And also because of the international partners, it is paradox way we find many good partners inside of Ukraine. So I'm again, I'm very glad to greet all my, all my partners from Ukraine. And I, I'm very ready to and glad to appreciate uh, this possibility to participate in this workshop. If you have any questions to me, I'm here to answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Dear Madam Vice-Rector, thank you very much for your presentation, presentation and uh, I'm opening the discussion parts. Uh, quick questions from our participants online. If you do have some questions addressed to uh, Madam Vice-Rector. Okay, so may I ask a question? Thank you. Okay, so at Oles Hanchar Dnipro National University, we also have some, some programs of, dub, of joint double diplomas, but we have a major problem that at master level we have uh, this kind of some discrepancy between the duration of these programs. At our university, it is three semesters, and at most European universities, master programs last for four semesters. Do you have such a program? And if you have, how do you overcome it? Uh, thank you so much for this question. Yes, this is the biggest challenge for the most of the Ukrainian master programs. And I want to answer by two answers. First of all, our successful uh, experience with the University of L'Aquila in Italy is caused by the fact that this is program of two years master degree. This is so-called educational research program. And there is no problem to cooperate with our partners from Italy because they also have the system of four semesters. This is a good experience. But also we have experience to overcome this disparity between our system of three semesters 
and the mostly European system of the four semesters. For example, this program with Slovak University, we have such a solution that our students during the first year, they're studying physically in our university. Our partner is recognizing all the credits and all results of the study from our university. And physically, during the second year, they are moving to Slovak Republic and they are studying the courses in Slovak Republic. And during this semester, they're only making their practice in Ukraine, in our universities. And because they are IT students, it is possible to do this online, to do some, uh, some practical uh, tasks from uh, the supervisor or from some IT firm where they are in practice. And also they are making the diploma inside in Ukraine, but supervised by specialists from Ukraine. But uh, the, in the, at the end, our students at the last point, it, this is, he is moving or she is moving to Ukraine to defend their thesis. Or if it is allowed, it was allowed during the COVID times that students uh, was defending this thesis, staying in the Slovak Republic uh, in online mode. He or she is receiving the diploma from our university and during the last semester, uh, students is staying in uh, Bratislava and receiving the diploma from Slovak Republic. So it is so kind asymmetric, asymmetrical approach to the uh, double degree because, because of the three and four semester challenge. Also, I want to stress that this program is a very good um, challenge, a good example of the cooperation of stakeholders. The study of our students in Slovak Republic is funded by the IT Association of Slovak Republic. So our students are staying in Slovak for free and their study are supported from the IT Association and they're receiving some stipend from this IT Association. But from as another point of view, we realize that this is the challenge of the brain drain of Ukraine because we understand that many businesses from European countries they are looking for our students as a potential employees for their enterprises. But we are living in the democratic states. We are living in the open Europe. We have to be prepared for this challenge and we have to to push our society, our economics after the war to be competitive for our students. Because currently this is, now it's for me is a challenge is that not our university have to be competitive for our economy. Sometimes our economy have to be competitive for our students, uh, for our graduates, because they are in big demand in Europe. We are speaking about engineers, medicine, and IT specialists. Dear Madam Vice Rector, thank you so much for your answers. And Mrs. Mirnovas, thank you so much for your uh, question. Uh, and now, finally, it is my pleasure to give the floor to Monica Sonibaldi, who will address the issue of agreements on joint uh, doctorates uh, during her speech. Dear Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting us. So. Uh, this is uh, something that has been quite different from what has been said till now. And the subject of this short presentation has been suggested by our Vice Rector, Professor Antonella Baldi, who you already know, and uh, originates from the challenges we have had and still we must face with uh, joint programs at all levels. Uh, the, the, uh, the subject is agreements on joint doctorates. Why? Because uh, our analysis is focused on joint doctorates in the frame of the horizon uh, MSC uh, actions because of their uh, complexities, info, importance, and compliance to the Bologna process principles. At the end, the 
Horizon 2020 program. Okay. The European Research Area um, wanted to know what the uh, um, experience had been in, in the uh, joint programs. And the result was that event I mean, a clear deficit of information at various levels. And the programs uh, coordinated struggle to understand institutional, national, and transnational requirements, outlining that universities' administrative offices often lacked familiarity with joint doctorates. So, one year later, at the annual meeting uh, of the Italian Agency for Promotion of European Research, I was asked to coordinate a workshop on the agreement to deliver joint double PhDs at doctoral level. So, uh, when talking about GDs, we must recall, if I am able to switch, I would like to switch. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, if we see uh, the uh, Salzburg principle, uh, that are the um, Bologna process principle uh, governing doctoral uh, studies, we see that uh, uh, they stated that doctoral studies are fundamentally different from the first and second cycles. Uh, they, must, they require flexibility, as something uh, has been said before, autonomous, autonomous and uh, uh, accountable institutions, Internationalization uh, increased the quality of doctoral education and uh, mobility experience are uh, as important as they are for, uh, for the other cycle of study. Um, the national European legal framework should engage in innovative doctoral programs and that, this, uh, this is what is doing as is at European level. But um, when we see the, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks. When we see that the uh, Horizon program, we, uh, we see that the, um, La, the, this, this indication are uh, fully integrated in the program that has uh, put international networking at the, at the base of this, uh, of its uh, uh, goals and uh, makes the principle, uh, the Salzburg principle, uh, program action through dual and joint degrees mobility that is made at through second sorry through segments and doctoral networks uh, uh, not only are encouraged but the uh, final goal of doctoral networks are joint doctorates and uh, joint doctorates must lead to uh, joint, double, multiple doctoral degrees recognize it at uh, least in two EU member states and associate countries. This statement anticipates most of the challenges higher education face when it comes to joint doctorate agreements. Again, Okay. What are the main challenges? Differences in doctoral program. The uh, Salzburg principle say that they should uh, last for three to four years. 
It is not so in many countries, also in Europe. They should, uh, they, uh, as far as uh, the uh, eligibility, the criteria for, for admission, they, it, students should have uh, achieved a, a bachelor master uh, diploma, but it is not so in some countries still. The national legal system not allowing for the word of a joint degree because, uh, and it, this also has been said, uh, because of a lack in, in the uh, legislation of the country. And therefore, the guidelines presently have uh, uh, stated that uh, uh, it must be signed an, an agreement on the award of a, a joint multiple double degree before submitting a project, a joint uh, doctoral uh, within the MSCA. Because in the past, some uh, projects weren't funded because the partnership couldn't afford that and money was uh, not spent. National legal system not providing an employment contract to doctoral candidates. This is a problem here uh, now in Italy, because uh, the, the uh, national legislation, legislation has recently changed, and uh, contract for researchers are very high level guarantee uh, an employment contract so only uh, for high level researchers so we must solve this problem in italy so what are the best practices sorry uh, this time <laughs> best practices are no, you should, should you should go back sorry I'm very creative. Uh, when uh, uh, you participate in a, um, in a consortium, joint uh, uh, doctor uh, MSSCA consortium, uh, you, take, you must take into consideration that there are partners that there are not universities. Research institutions can participate, but they can't, in many cases, in, in the majority of the case, award a de doctoral degree. So they must be affiliated to universities. This uh, means that uh, at the very begin uh, beginning, when uh, a coordinating institution wants to, to create a new partnership, to, to, to apply to JAD, must uh, look for partners, university that does, must be a doctoral degree, a doctoral degree uh, awarding universities, institutions, and that must be accredited, not only accredited because as an institution, but also the uh, doctoral courses must be accredited. They uh, must um, uh, operate according to national legislation and provi internal provision. This is a check that our uh, offices do when uh, working on a joint, new joint programs with the horizon, because we have had until now so many problems. Uh, once uh, the project approved, we had to sign agreements with uh, co-tutel agreements or the consortium agreement with the partner. Uh, it, this has been said, but uh, uh, I repeat, this information can be useful. From six months to three years, it takes to sign an agreement in, uh, sorry, uh, uh, with uh, partners uh, and not only associate partners in the industry that have a pro problems connected to uh, uh, um, prop priority uh, of data and accessibility, etc., but also with partner universities that are very strict 
um, the uh, legislation, national and legislation, and internal uh, provision to to award a degree also at doctoral level. So all uh, offices in charge of the doctoral administration should be uh, checked and involved uh, at, at the very beginning and uh, um, communi a communication flow as usual with projects uh, should be established. Then uh, the eligibility should be checked. Um, also the, uh, the uh, program research and uh, study plans should be uh, consistent within them. And uh, um, the uh, maximum uh, duration of the fellowship that should be three to uh, four years, according to the the uh, duration of the uh, the study program, study and research program. In the past edition of the Euro, uh, Horizon 2020, the uh, scholarship, uh, the scholarship, sorry, the fellowship lasted only three years. So there were uh, countries uh, in the, in, uh, in, I say, for example, uh, the, the Netherlands uh, that uh, 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 had to pay the fourth year today doctoral uh, candidates. So there was always a problem to, to make them partic participate in our project. And uh, also admission uh, uh, you must consider the uh, calendar because in some countries, you, as you know, also doctoral studies start in a different uh, semester. So in August, for example, and not in October, February. This means that the study plan and research activities must be uh, coordinated within the partnership. And uh, um, then we talk about before the, the, of ECTS. ECTS, uh, it is not mandatory to have ECTS uh, for uh, doctoral studies, but as you know, there are uh, countries where ECTS are uh, very important because the uh, program, the study program, the, 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 the education training for doctoral student uh, uh, it's, a, the, um, it's a primary part of the, the activity and lasts from one year to five years. And then they, they make research, I cut. I'm finishing. Um, defense, thesis, defense, etc. So, Recommendation, the slides that you have already. <laughs> so, what is the, uh, the Salzburg principle uh, say? That dual degrees should be reviewed to facilitate international collaboration, coherence and transparency. Uh, in the meantime, flexibility is setting the, in setting the requirement is important. And then uh, the uh, label, uh, the, the pilot announced before, has uh, produced some results also for our uh, alliance. The, the project EDFish uh, uh, is uh, committing to work on PhD level. I'm finished. Dear Ms. Anabaldi, thank you so much for your kind presentation. It was a pleasure to, to know more about, about the topic of uh, agreements on joint doctorates. And uh, now I'm pleased to announce that we will now be opening up the discussion part uh, of, the, of the second round table. So please again, if, my, if our colleagues, uh, online participants, have some questions, it is the time to, to ask. And my and our colleagues from from your audience. Yes, 
професорка жива. I have a general question actually to, to everyone, which uh, also relates to, to uh, my eternal problem with uh, European mobility, which is the language and the uh, problem of uh, multilingualism versus English as a communicating language. And I think the joint degrees uh, are one of the ways how we can maybe bring more linguistic diversity into, into the, the um, uh, European high education area. And on the other hand, of course, this might create obstacles. It's actually, I have a side question to Bernie. How is it now with uh, French universities? Do you need to deliver the thesis in French? still or uh, is there a allowance because i know this this might then create problems for the joint degrees but on the other hand of course it's it's more general problem you know uh do we uh, because because uh my experience from Charles University is that sometimes the involvement in double degrees uh, means, of course, extra work because everything is being done in English. So it's not there is no chance to involve the students in in the classes that are being delivered. It might be easier in uh, countries where the big languages are spoken. So in German, in French, you know, the students would be more willing to to learn the language, but uh, is there, and, and uh, you know, this, this would be also an interesting topic for the European label. I, I forgot to ask actually after the keynote if, if the language provisions are included in the pilot, because this, you know, I, I can see positive and negative uh, on, on both, on insistence on, of English as the language of communication and on the opening of, for the other, other languages. Okay, I can answer the question about the French situation, um, and I will say it maybe in a, in a uh, funny way. The French have the um, uh, habitude that they are used to ignore the laws that don't make sense. They don't change them, they just ignore them. And I think that's the case with these French theses. Uh, I think the law has not changed, so we are still obliged to write the thesis in French. In practice, it's no longer the case. As a supervisor and as a jury member and so on, I have seen many theses that were written in English uh, if they had a summary in French. And the summary was between three and ten pages or something, so it's not very long and sometimes written by the supervisor. So that's the situation. <laughs> Um, I also think, and just a comment to the multilingualism, I think it's very important that we address this topic. Uh, I think that really multilingualism should be also multiculturalism, so we should really have in these mobility periods uh, an aspect getting into this other culture, not just going to another place and speaking English, especially in, in my field, chemistry, but in, in others it's probably the same. Um, the chemistry is not so different from one country to another. The, the molecules behave the same. Um, so the <laughs> advantage to go into another country is because I meet other people. And if I really want to interact with them, then I better speak their language and I grab some information on the street and so on. So I think in our mobility schemes, the other language should be part of it, um, but can be a part that we are offering while the person is there, or maybe preparing it shortly before and so on. So it should not be the obstacle, you must be fluent in Czech before you can come to Prague. If you speak enough English to do chemistry in Prague, then you can go to Prague, but we will learn you Czech or something like this shortly before you go there, and then maybe on site, and the same, of course, for France and for all the other countries. So that's my approach to, to that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Hasenkov, for your answers, your kind contribution. So, uh, if we don't have uh, any other questions, maybe I have one. If I may, uh, if you have the time for that, uh, on the doctoral, joint doctoral degrees. Um, many of our PhD students are also employees of the university, not only because they are uh, doing their PhD, but also because they are teaching assistant or they have some other roles. Uh, is this an obstacle for mobility? Because it's like the academic mobility, like... Uh... Uh, in some cases, yes, 
because uh, we know that in some case uh, uh, people uh, um, that have been uh, recruited to, to as an administrative um, can offices officer cannot uh, have a mobil uh, mobility uh, at, uh, sorry uh, abroad. But it depends on the, your national legislation. If uh, if uh, uh, the, in the consent that uh, these people uh, spent some time abroad, abroad, see, sorry, abroad uh, uh, then uh, there's no problem. It is not uh, stated uh, anywhere in, in the uh, EU legislation on, uh, on joint uh, doctorates, on the guidelines, do not say anything about that. But it's, uh, the problems are the national legislation. In Sweden, uh, they, uh, the uh, doctoral students are uh, recruited at, as um, personnel, administrative personnel, so it is impossible for us to have them seconded to our university. And uh, uh, if in case we should send some uh, doctoral student to them, uh, the uh, Swedish university should recruit them as uh, administrative personnel, so. Does it work? It's, yes, it, it, we, we would like to, in the past, we had asked the Karoliska to be our partner. They, they had to, to give up mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yes, Katharine? And maybe, that's, is it, yeah. <laughs> maybe this is where the flexibility comes in again. Mm -hmm. um, if you do have like, six months mobility but you can shorten it to one month stays that but might be easier for doctoral candidates to proceed also they are bound to laboratories with uh, i don't know their work so it's it's much easier if they can stay for one month abroad and for several periods um, that might be an option thank you very much this is reinhardt for your Answer. Uh, we still have time. We still have a few minutes, uh, and uh, I have one uh, point. Uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to raise some questions provided by Wilhelm Bomke from uh, from the uh, Regensburg University of Applied Sciences, who unfortunately cannot be here. Uh, but I do wish him all the best and uh, speedy recovery. And Mr. Bonke uh, addressed some points, uh, some particular problems, areas, uh, speaking of obstacles for joint degrees and how to overcome them. And I'm so glad that we are opening this task to, uh, for now. And um, there are so many problems, areas, such as lack of trust, lack of motivation, lack of support from university leadership, departments, money, and so on. And uh, maybe we can share some, some uh, bad and good uh, experiences from from our side, uh, speaking of obstacles of uh, joint degrees and how actually we can overcome them. Maybe it is about particular examples we can we can share during this section. To announce that that um, uh, Wilhelm Bomke from from Regensburg was also also supposed to come, but uh, because of health issues, he he could not he could not make it. But I, actually, it was was one thing that uh, that I was. I was thinking about it's, uh, that the joint degrees and double degrees are really uh, um, based on trust and they are really a manifestation of long-term partnership because precisely because of those um, legal obstacles uh, that need to be overcome and sometimes just ignored. <laughs> And uh, and I think this is this is something that that's unique for uh, academic academic community 
that it's actually uh, the effort to to overcome uh, overcome the obstacles and uh, well we have the charles university has a um, joint uh, joint degree program with uh, the university of um, uh, uh, sapienza roma in the uh, in the field of german uh, studies and slavic studies and it was precisely this you know terrible problem of employment of you know registration that uh, that really needed an effort uh, of of both sides and it was also the problem of the language you know in what what language actually the students should study what language they should they should present their their thesis and uh and and also and this is this is one one important thing that i wanted to say that uh, this uh, this double degree was also made possible because of the involvement of other uh, italian universities which pursue the same career and i think sometimes actually it's even more difficult to establish a joint degree with another national university than to establish it with uh, actually university abroad you know, uh, and and I think this is this is something, and this is also one thing that comes to my mind that the academic uh, milieu is extremely competitive, and actually it's sometimes it's very healthy because through competition we achieve excellence in science, but at the same time we should not uh, forget that we are members of the academic community and that we are partners and that you know sometimes really the competition is also and i will not lie to you you know demographic trends are against us so we compete for students we compete for international students we compete for national students we compete for resources so uh, so uh, sometimes this can obscure and it's also also what our what our ukrainian partners are stressing again and again you know the brain drain the 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 effort effort to steal for ourselves the students and especially the brightest students because they are the future uh, you know Nobel Prize uh, bearers that then move our universities in in the rankings but uh, you know f we are we are really the partners and we should look for for improvement via cooperation you know there is a saying in Czech that, that professionals cooperate and amateurs compete so maybe we, we should bear this in mind and and we should put it into practice and uh, in overcoming those those uh, obstacles at the same time i think this is precisely what what professor uh, isaacs was talking about in the morning it's up on us to pressure our national governments to remove as much of those administrative obstacles as is possible even though of course we should always respect the national sovereignty and the academic sovereignty of the universities but we should really try to to make uh, the administrative administrative procedures as smooth as possible. Dear Professor Krizhova, thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, if we don't have uh, any other questions, so and as, as time is pushing us forward, or Mr. Uh, Asinkov? I would just like to say that I very much agree with you that uh, we should not only be, or we shouldn't be competitive, but uh, partnership brings us much further. Uh, and I would like to add another point in this, well, competition is also sometimes or very often uh, associated to exclusion. If we have this, uh, this point we are saying here that we want to have joint degrees, uh, joint doctoral degrees and so on, we favor the mobility of the PhD students. We already said for the undergraduate students this morning, it should not be for the rich and privileged. At the PhD students, we have uh, another level of difficulties. Uh, they are older than the undergraduate students, so they might have a family, they might have children, they might have uh, another work-life balance that a student. And this is also something that we have to take into account if we make these uh, joint degrees and so on. So it's, uh, there, are, there are other difficulties. Mm -hmm. 
examples uh, of of the of the good practice i don't know i i don't want to 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 call out our our other partners but maybe maybe uh, i know budapest has has also great uh, experience with with joint degrees actually i was part of one uh, of on master level with with elta so i know you have you have uh, great uh, experience but also there are obstacles Yes, uh, there are not so many joint degrees uh, at ELTA. Um, um, maybe the, the most uh, um, interesting uh, one now is uh, the one that we uh, made in the context of the European University Alliance that we are part of, uh, the CharmEU. Um, so basically, uh, during the first five years of the of the of the alliance, we. Um, uh, we 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 uh, already launched the joint degree, and we have our first graduates. Uh, so this this was this this was a very unique experience for us, uh, and it was quite a different experience. Also, of course, building on on our previous joint um, masters. So, so we uh, um, gathered information as much as possible from from that. Also, we were very happy that. Uh, um, to experience that the Hungarian legislation was uh, very behind and during this process of doing this joint degree of um, in the universe, uh, European University uh, Alliance context the regulation was changed to a very favorable one so now uh, in, now we are in a state that when we are negotiating uh, um, about new uh, joint or double degrees we are uh, um, in a better position than some of our partners, and it wasn't the case before. Um, when it comes to double degrees, uh, we are very uh, we we have the desire, but uh, but and uh, and the, the vision, but also not not many double degrees happening at this moment. It's being investigated, and um, um, also in the context of uh, the the new. Um, developments made in uh, credit recognition, which is a first step towards also doing double degrees, which I will talk about in my presentation. But um, so more or less, this is the situation more, or these could be some interesting points for our from our side. Thank you so much, Catalin, for your kind contribution. And now, yeah, if we don't have any further questions? Yes, so we can see that we have one from our online participants. Um, Madam Vice-Rector, uh, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you so much. I want to add to the discussion about the best experience. From my point of view, I support the vision. If you want to have a good double degree program, everything is uh, relying on the trust. Our experience of the good program starts from the mobility of the teachers. If you want to get a good program, you have to see your counterpart, your partner, uh, academics from the other part of the Europe, uh, uh, eyes by eyes, you have to discuss the challenge, you have to discuss the approach to the teaching, you have to see the campus, where your students will be studying during a semester or two, and then you can move ahead. Our experience of this good program with the Slovak uh, Republic, with the University of Economics and Management in Bratislava, was preceded by three rounds of negotiations between rectors, between two deans, and we welcome in Ushgorod also the representatives of the Slovakian business who was eager to support our students. And only after this, the dean of the faculty was ready to advertise this program to the students. And I think this is a good approach because in Ukraine, uh, students mostly start the educational uh, path at the stage of the 70s. They are not even adults on this stage. Then uh, when she or he is studying uh, joint program or double program uh, on the baccalaureate level, it is still the young person of 19 or 20 years old. And it is really difficult for them without the support from the staff from another university to do all the 
uh, business with documents, with the residence permits, with accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. That's why I think that um, we have to think about the quality of the double degrees, not about the quantity of the double degrees. And we have to think that behind all these degrees, we have uh, young people who are not very experienced in the real world and, uh, and they are struggling with the many opportunities that are created in, uh, for them. And my feeling is that we do not have to compete as universities. We have to compete, my feeling, with the digital education, with the digital courses. Because if you ask many uh, young people who are finishing graduate schools, some of them will tell that I do not need university because I have Coursera, I have EdTechs and other platforms, and I take all the knowledge from the web. And um, there, this is some reasons, these are reasonable things, but we have to explain that university and university education is not only not about only the knowledge and some digital skills. It is also about the educations, communications, socialization, and about the languages. And um, going back to the discussion about the languages, we have a good experience at the university, which is located on the border with different European countries. We have three kilometers to Slovak border, 25 kilometers to the border in Hungary, around 80 kilometers to the border with Romania and 40 kilometers to the border of the Pol Poland Republic. And inside of our university, we have uh, the departments of the Hungarian, Slovak, Czech, uh, Polish languages and Romanian languages. And we're trying to um, organize at least semester mobility inside these countries. But before this, we are proposing to our students some insight uh, free courses of the Central European languages. So uh, um, students can go to these countries at least on the level of communications with uh, students uh, to speak about some normal things. And also they can take as elective discipline uh, the language of this uh, country. When they are going back to our university, they know or not only English or German, they also have some knowledge, maybe on the level of A2 or B1, of one Central European language. I think this is good for the European unity to think not only about the big languages, but also to think about the small languages which create the heritage of European language. And also about Italian experience, we were talking about the University of L'Aquila. We have only also a good experience with the University of Foggia from Italy. Uh, our students were proposed to take as elective language, Italian language. And after one semester, or we have experienced that some students were spending the time in Foggia for two semesters, they go back to Ukraine with good knowledge of Italian language. And Italian language is a big heritage for Europe because Italy is the only country which is using the Italian languages. And I think that this approach that we are proposing the, for the students some extra activities uh, to know the language of the countries where they're studying in will benefit to everybody and will inherit also the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam Vice Rector, for your kind insight. And we have another question. From... Can I react to, to this, if you have the time? Uh, thank you for, for your comments. I would like to react to uh, the thing that you have said about the competition with Coursera and so on with MOOCs. Um, in my opinion, I don't see it so much as a competition, uh, just as something that is complementary. I might have seen it as a competition before COVID. After COVID, now our students came happily back on the campus and are thankful for in-person education or just coming back to the campus to work in the library and so on. So um, I think um, they are no longer just thinking that uh, it's, uh, we can all learn online. But at the same time, by the MOOC or 
over the COVID period, they have seen what is possible online. So now they are much more demanding in like, well, if you just give a lecture and it's only the teacher who is talking, this you can do by video and then I can see it at home and this will make it easier for me. So I think they, they make this difference. It's not a competition, it's something that the students see as something complementary. Uh, and there's another thing that I, will, I, in my opinion, will change fundamentally our teaching. It's uh, artificial intelligence. We have seen it with uh, ChatGPT uh, as one of the <laughs> uh, conversational artificial intelligence that just came out a couple of months ago and it has hundreds of hundred millions of users at the moment. Uh, and I think it's something that we have to integrate very rapidly into our teaching because um, instead of blocking it, it's not a competition. I know that some universities in the United States, a university in Paris and so on, have, un uh, have um, forbidden the use of ChatGPT. Uh, I think that's a wrong way to do it. I think it's also some technology that we have to take into account in our teaching. So it's, for me, it's not a competition between these type of things and, and our in-person teaching. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Asenkov, for your kind contribution. So uh, we still have five minutes, so we can... I, I still remember my old prof some older professors forbidding me to use Wikipedia. So, so you know, it's I think really we need to work as we learn as we learn to work with online tools during COVID, turn them into good good servant, not a bad boss. Then I think we we should we should work with, with this. But but I fully agree that uh, some some students might have returned enthusiastic, but some other students got especially the younger ones, the ones who were affected by COVID during their high school studies, I think some of them are, are affected and, and it is sometimes difficult to persuade them to, uh, to, to engage in person. So this is another challenge that I think the international cooperation can, can uh, be, be more, more, more productive to, to uh, face than if we face it alone. Thank you very much, Professor Kujova, for your insights. So still we have five minutes. So any other uh, questions from our online participants or our participants in the auditorium? I cannot see any, any hands. So uh, as time is pushing us forward, let me, yes. <laughs> yes, please, uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours. And I just wanted to ask Ksenia. Yes, I of course, yes, of course. Yes, Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yeah, so some of my reflections and observations, because this topic is really very important and crucial for all of us within the double diploma. And double diploma could be assessed as the cherry of the cake, because this is the long pathway. Uh, it's starting with some point, and then with this uh, these final cherry, we couldn't uh, really see these uh, trustful uh, relations between higher educations. I fully agree that we could not compare such additional uh, digital tools as Coursera, edX, or others. Um, now we are elaborating, uh, so I'm just sharing with you the information because uh, since the full-scale invasion started uh, in Ukraine, in the whole territory of Ukraine, it was an idea on creating the Open Ukrainian University. And this uh, idea was not to combine all that additional courses. But now this idea is evaluated, it is ev uh, developed uh, within the creating of special digital content to the academic courses. Coursera and edX never could be, could be interchangeable with the academic courses. Uh, and the, the most higher uh, quality of the higher education. So we are all aware of the quality. Uh, that there's really combination of uh, personal education, physical education, and some additional digital content. Of course, we could really discuss 
uh, chat GPT, uh, we could uh, imagine a lot these um, fantastic uh, things that are really very compared with some space, uh, space engineers. But at the same time, the young people within their education should be within the society and should feel this interaction between their uh, academic uh, professors and their teachers. So I think that mm, it never could be interchangeable. So it always should be combined together. Uh, I really do hope that uh, this idea that I stressed will be in force, but now I could not say because I cannot say in advance, we are waiting for the decision on some European institutions on that, but uh, I'm really keeping my fingers crossed on that, that it could be the possibility for Ukraine to establish the new kind of digital content only supplementary to the additional academic courses. Uh, while we were speaking um, during this year, the, the most complicated and challengeable year for Ukrainian higher education institutions, of course, we are speaking about the uh, avoiding of the brain drain, preventing some risky uh, aspects for our students, but and in what forms we could do it. And one of the way out that could be visualized as the truly win-win story, it could be within the double degree programs, really. Uh, among the existing partners, existing uh, truthfully and uh, very strong relations between partners, it could not be the general network, couldn't be really uh, strong connections with, with partners. But as we, as we can see now, uh, from my perspective, um, of course, we are all hope that the war finished uh, in the nearest future. But at the same time, um, now we are thinking how to, uh, how to rebuild, how to, uh, to make uh, our educational programs uh, attractive because they are really strong. And this is, this is the, the way, Cototel's double diploma programs, it really uh, one of the issues that could be based on the mobility and then upheld with, the, another, bri with another brick uh, as the recognition of that part of credits that are provided by, by partners. So um, I'm not abusing my, my, my speech on that. Uh, I mean, the, abusing the time. Uh, we are aware of this time, uh, but really these issues are very crucial for, for our system. Thank you. Dear Madam Vice Rector, thank you so much for your, for your contribution and uh, really fruitful discussion uh, of these parts of our international event. Yes, yes, Mr. Vassenhoff, we still have some minutes. Creating those resources um, and uh, sounds uh, something very, very interesting to me. Is it something like the open educational resources that, for example, also UNESCO is favoring very much? Um, so having resources available to everybody to be included in its own teaching. Nowadays in Ukraine, the current situation that this is the chaotic digitalization. Uh, this is very unsys uh, unsystematized uh, system of digital content. There are so many possibilities. Global faculty that was introduced as well for, for, for Ukrainian higher education. But uh, global faculty, it's really very useful instrument, but there are no credits, if I'm not mistaken, or they're using as the it's not even the micro credentials, it's just supplementary certificated uh, credits. And uh, not always these credits could be recognized within the programs. Another uh, platform, uh, Kovaroda platform that was provided by Kiev Mohil Academy in Ukraine. It's also within the open lectures for some visiting professors. But at the same time now, when we can see among the a lot of among the Ukrainian universities, 
now there is no one unified platform for courses that could be available for everybody. Um, there are a lot of platforms made by universities that are accessible for students. Or additionally, for everybody, but uh, with the credits that are not inside the curricula. Vice Rector, for your kind contribution. And now, unfortunately, I have to close this section and cordially invite you to the coffee break. And unfortunately, I cannot invite, we cannot invite our online participants, but maybe in the future we will have such opportunity. Yes, <laughs> Madam Vice Rector, we will join you after a few seconds. So thank you for, so much for all presentation. Thank you so much for really fruitful and interesting discussion of this, of this part of the event. Thank you. And of course, we will continue as scheduled at 3.45 p.m. when we will have our final third round table, uh, which will be about uh, Bologna process and Erasmus. Thank you.
<coughs> Dear esteemed guests, distinguished colleagues and our participants, so I would like to take this opportunity to open the last um, uh, round table, Bologna Process and Erasmus. And um, before we start, I have one point uh, to discuss with you and actually one inquiry. Um, I would like to ask uh, representatives of Dnipro National University if they will allow us to, to uh, shift Professor uh, Vice Rector Smirnova presentation as the first one in the round table due to Professor's intens intensive time table and, and the schedule. Uh, for, Vice Rector Ksenia Smirnova has to uh, leave uh, after a few minutes, and if I may ask you for your permission to do so. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Natalia. So, Vice Rector uh, Ksenia Smirnova, the floor, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much and thank you for that my urgent issues because the timetable is really very dynamic and very intensive so I'm but definitely I will be with you but more remotely status if I may. Uh, my speech today uh, even with the name uh, it's about the academic mobility but I titled it as a anchors and wine mills so what are the problems and what are the perspectives. So what are these anchors that we could discuss with us? And what are these perspectives for Ukrainian universities? Uh, as we all mentioned that academic mobility is one of the Bologna process priorities and an effective tool for improving the quality of education. And having joined the Bologna process in 2005 by Ukraine and thereby recognizing the promotion of mobility, as one of the goals on the way of the creation of the European higher education area, Ukraine for, uh, for the last 18 years has supported and fulfilled these tasks declared in the decisions of the conferences of ministers of European countries responsible for the field of higher education on reforming of national education system. Uh, and we had a lot of plans. We had a lot of ambitious perspectives. But with the beginning of the all out invasion uh, of Russia into Ukraine, conducting the educational process became more difficult. In particular, this applies to exercise the right of academic mobility. Uh, the, the military invasion uh, and its consequences made it necessary to update the legislation regulating the issue of, of academic mobility uh, of the educational process participants. And that's why in May last year, the, uh, during the meeting of the government, the procedure for the exercise of the right to academic mobility was approved and the amendments were approved. And the implementation of that new rules uh, within, the amend within the amendments of this governmental act made it possible to guarantee the right to a safe education of students forced to leave their place of permanent residence in Ukraine and move to safer regions of Ukraine or abroad to facilitate to return of students to Ukraine after the end of termination of martial law and to officially enroll the results of such education after the completion of the academic mobility. Uh, a month ago, we organized the All Ukrainian Roundtable on the problems and perspective of academic mobility, uh, where uh, the majority of universities participated. And uh, as the result of this roundtable, we elaborated the special thesis and recommendations that would be provided to the European institutions to the European Association, European Universities Association, to our government, government as well. Let me share with you some of the results of this round table, speaking about the Erasmus plus possibilities and problems of the mobility. So the main problems that arise today in the framework of academic mobility programs are the following, and I will stress it with, the, with some uh, Point. The adopted procedure and amendments to this procedure does not regulate the issue of the right to academic mobility of male participants of the educational process. So this is our first challenge. Uh, 
the age of conscription during the introduction of martial law in our country. Low level of students' awareness of the possibility of participation in mobility programs, as well as lack of understanding of the process of academic mobility. And now we are working on sharing these best practices and sharing the information among students that allow them to use these mobility programs instead of residing abroad. Another problem, this is the chaotic application of students of foreign universities that are not partners, for example, with Ukrainian universities. This is one of the aspects, and after that, it was a huge increasing of amount of new partnerships. But this process was a little bit chaotic because of the students were fleed everywhere. And as a result, students do not always receive the information from foreign higher education institutions about the list of disciplines, conditions for recognizing academic credits, financing, available social services during the implementation of the mobility program and living conditions. Another problem, another problem, another challenge, I would say, I don't like this word problem, transformation of mobility into educational tourism. Because uh, uh, students do not always make efforts while studying at another university. Remote closure of mobility complicates the communication and causes misunderstanding of the parties. It's also one of the challenge. Of course, within even the first round table, we, we discussed today one of the problem, brain drain. Migration of the educational process participants to more, to another countries, which is, uh, which, uh, we, which are associated with another standards of living, uh, possibilities of carrying out scientific research and so on. It is said to state, but most of them choose the latter option, considering it's more attractive conditions. That's why we are appealing to our partners to communicate with students, to spread the information about that and to save these links with their home institutions. The biggest problem at that moment, of course, is the difficulty of crossing the border of male academic mobility participants. Um, and we are doing a lot uh, on trying to give this fair opportunity to all the participants but at the same time, it's out of our competence because this is only the border service competence to regulate this issue. And thus, many issues remain unsettled and open. So that's why these virtual uh, grounds and virtual platforms and virtual instruments of mobility are really very crucial for for the participants. What are the educational challenges? So from the point of view of educational process, uh, I will also stress it in, uh, in systema systematization of points. First of all, the issue of adapting the educational process in those programs where a significant proportion of students were involved in mobility process. What does it mean? Thus, due to the recognition of mobility results, a significant part of students had to withdraw from certain disciplines, from the uh, home institutions, and then they should pay more attention with other disciplines. Another side of this coin, that this outflow of students to under the mobility undermined the process of learning by academic groups. In different universities, there are different criteria and conditions. For example, instead of 15 people in the group, there could be up to five or seven. This issue was resolved ad hoc. All disciplines were kept, but the continuing trend 
will require a rethinking of the educational process that really could make the consequence of the reduction of the courses, reduction of the possibility for professors to continue with their disciplines and so on. Second one, increase in the duration of mobility. The total duration of mobility can be three semesters. One and a half years. Thus, it becomes quite difficult to plan the educational process and recognize the results of that non, never ended, not, not never, but endless mobility. The third one, mobility of graduate students, especially of those who applied for mobility independently or apply to the host university with a request for continued mobility due to the war and inability to return home. Until recently, there were no cases of mobility of students of the final year in the last semester in spring. But now it happens. And the question of recognition of the results arises. How to do it, whether it should be done at all, and how it combined with all that issues. In each individual case, there are solutions, but the process is not without discussions and disputes. The need to attract uh, the fourth one that is really very important that you want to, 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 to pay more attention on that and um, just stress on that. The need to attract incoming mobility. We can see now during the last dust year imbalance with the mobility. I mean that the all flows of the mobility, I speaking on behalf of Ukraine, it's outcome mobility. But this is brutal, decreasing of amount of incoming mobility. But at the same time, before the invasion, we stressed on the priority to balance incoming and outcoming of students. So this need to attract incoming mobility in a distant format is a promising priority because the increase in number of foreign students will contribute to the improvement of the quality of cultural communication and the processes of internationalization of the universities. Today, the number of Ukrainian universities have developed powerful informational system using information and telecommunication technologies to ensure the continuation of education in those specialties for each it is provided. So, and there are no obstacles for providing these incoming students to Ukrainian universities virtually, regardless of all other security issues that could be connected with that, uh, with that, um, with that case. Uh, the next uh, challenge, uh, the problem of recognition of educational components since the educational program do not coincide. Convincing the inter to internationalize and make the program English speaking is also a very relevant topic, especially for the technical specialties and technical mayors. The implementation of joint programs, so we stressed on that just before in the previous round table. Joint programs with foreign institutions is a very urgent action. Now it's an urgent action. The programs may be tangential and similar at first sight, but the implementation in practice has not demonstrated sufficient effectiveness because such programs are in fact different in specific details, educational components that could not coincide by semester. Despite the fact that the programs were seen as urgent actions to help provide the educational process, these actions didn't work, unfortunately. Another potential challenge that could solve this issue and could be seen as a uh, windmill, the creation of a single platform for managing academic mobility, both international and internal, 
I mean internal, national, in, within the country. As it is necessary to take into account the significant number of students displaced within the country, and such a platform could be a response to today's challenges and a contribution to the development of the higher education. It is worth mentioning that the results can be achieved only with bona fide partners, as we stressed already, that are based on the trust, who have close relations with their partners. And the work to achieving synergy of curricula and educational components is a subject for further detailed discussions and the formation of an appropriate approach. All the mentioned challenges help to rethink previously established approaches. Uh, and there are a lot of instruments that are given now to rethinking that. We mentioned already the uh, processes of the European Universities Initiative within the alliances. It's also one of the issue, how to resolve this issue between the group of universities that are inside the islands. Uh, the following positive aspects as a wine mills in the implementation of academic mobility should be mentioned. Firstly, the significant increase in the number of participants in academic mobility. Uh, dear Kati Isak strength, uh, 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 said in the beginning that the increasing amount of mobility uh, among the graduators. So now we can see it in Ukraine dramatically change the situation. For example, our university, in our university, the amount of mobility, formed mobility, increased in 75%. So it's tremendous uh, path ahead. Another positive aspect, it's really active development of international cooperation collaborations. And we, uh, we obtained uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of additional partnerships, but at the same time, these partnerships are chaotic because of that uh, unstable migration. Providing Ukrainian students with a great number of grant proposals for participation in mobility and the special educational programs in leading foreign higher educational institutions and additional national supporting, not only for the Erasmus funds, but additionally with national funds. So all that uh, grant proposals that were done to, uh, to Ukrainian students. A significant expansion of the range of forms of academic mobility open to Ukrainian participants within the framework of international agreements, Erasmus Plus programs. Um, additional forms of mobility have been added, internships, practice, uh, seminars, workshops, etc. The rise uh, in the number of invited foreign professors, lecturers, and giving students the opportunity to listen to lectures remotely. It helps, it helps to understand better the process of organizing academic mobility in foreign higher education institutions. It helps to provide internationalization at home, by the way. So it's also strengthening these, um, these strategic priorities of, 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 of our universities. The significant increase of pro in proposals regarding student participation in remote projects, such as NICE program, HUG um, uh, virtual network, we stressed the Finnish uh, open university, uh, open university from the UK, uh, virtual Bavarian universities. There are so many examples uh, that, that really provide the opportunity to student to participate in remote manner within the mobility. And of course, the, participate, the opportunities to participate within the alliances of European universities that also have been expanded. We can focus on the main three operational goals. Implementation of the best foreign education experience in Ukraine, 
and we are now experiencing that and discovering these new opportunities. Adaptation of life and work in a multicultural environment, even digitally. Integration of scientific and uh, our academic staff into the open science, open educational area and other uh, open, uh, open areas. What are the needs? Uh, of course, uh, the student management e-campuses should be elaborated. Uh, I could share the experience that, for example, our students who are participating in Erasmus Plus mobility uh, pro uh, programs, they are gathering together within the established Erasmus Student Network. And uh, they are organizing, they are brainstorming, they are, sh they are sharing experience. So these instruments could really contribute into the uh, awareness of that uh, processes and these processes should be done in a proper way. Uh, under the mobility projects, of course, the internal procedures in universities should be updated. Nomination versus selection. We, within our round table, uh, we discussed the procedures and what elements of these procedures should be updated. Because, for example, from our side, we are very careful with the procedures, selection, or nomination. Uh, another challengeable issue and very touchable that it should be discussed and described mechanisms that ensure the return of students to the home universities after the mobility and reflect it in agreements. The communication and explanation of the Erasmus Plus partners, the institutional regulations, recognition mechanisms should be uh, communicated, should be shared in a more dynamic and powerful uh, uh, issue. Uh, students, so what are the needs for students? Grants, by the way, uh, there is another possibility of the zero grant possibility for the study. If the social payments are provided, access to labs, uh, involving into the networks, different networks, not only ECN networks, but even in other ones, self-governance uh, communities and so on. Uh, and of course, as we described, double diploma programs, joint programs with universities as well. Um, practical courses, virtual labs uh, that are based on the innovative software simulators, um, virtual or added reality and so on. Uh, of course, we are overcoming all that force majeure circumstances, but at the same time, we are looking forward all that needs that we discussed and we are elaborating in the special thesis, uh, we will spread, as I said, we will spread officially to the National Erasmus Office and to all our European partners. Uh, and these procedures in our reality uh, really need to be um, elaborated in a more unusual manner. Um, the, the, these processes and these tendencies are really very, uh, very uh, dynamic. Another very practical, imagine that our staff in the academic mobility offices, international relations offices, with a huge amount of these acts, applications, with the learning agreements and so on. So we are we should support not only students within the mobility, not only professors within the mobility. And especially these our staff who are servicing this mobility. 
sorry for maybe some emotional uh, issues. Uh, I do hope that it was really very, it was uh, fruitful to you uh, and uh, with sharing these uh, results of this our round table that we held uh, together with the majority of universities. Thank you. I will be grat grateful to answer your questions. <clears throat> Dear Madam Vice Rector, thank you so, so much for your informative presentation and details and uh, everything you did uh, for our cooperation, not only in the frame of uh, the Eastern Partnership University cluster. We do appreciate it. Uh, I would like to ask um, our colleagues to keep their questions until the end of this time, uh, until the end of this um, uh, roundtable, and after that, after we will open the discussion part when you will be able to to uh, to ask uh, uh, Professor uh, Smirnov uh, questions. So now, as uh, time is pushing up, so uh, it is my pleasure to invite uh, Mrs. Natalia Safonova from the International Relations Office um, uh, of uh, Oles Gonchar National University of Dnipro. And um, Mrs. Safonova will present her topic um, uh, about academic mobility development at Oles Gonchar Dnipro National University in the context of internationalization of higher education challenges and prospects. Uh, this is, dear Ms. Smirnova, the uh, screen is yours. Okay. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yeah, yeah. you can see yeah, my presentation. Okay. Uh, so, so let me present my topic, Academic Mobility Development at Oles Honchar Dnipro National University in the context of internalization of higher education challenges and prospects. Okay, so Ukraine was admitted to the Bologna process in 2005, and this event event has changed general principles of higher education in Ukraine. So at present, we can enumerate several of the most important features for our education, and they are comparable degrees, implementation of ECTS, mobility, quality assurance, lifelong learning, and learning outcomes, and assessment. Okay, so my report highlights academic mobility. I'd like to stress that academic mobility at Oles Honchar Dnipro National University is significant not only for the university itself, but for Dnipropetrovsk region and for the whole Ukraine, since it promotes the internalization of the higher education. Yeah, because international academic student and teacher mobility is the key instrument of the internalization of the higher education in the European Union. Well, I'd like to draw your attention to the most significant exchange result of Dnipro, Dnipro University. Uh, you can see that uh, DNU experiences bilateral exchange with the following higher educational institutions from different countries, such as Sweden, Lithuania, Latvia, Slovakia, Poland, Germany, France, and Tokyo. Uh, the list of uh, our Erasmus Plus uh, ECM partners is twice as long as the list of our partners of bilateral exchange. So it includes universities from Turkey, Italy, uh, Spain, France, Greece, Latvia, Germany, and Belgium. So one of the most successful program was 
double diploma at the Faculty of Physics, Electronics and Computer Systems. This double diploma was uh, at two specialities, physics and astronomy and applied physics and nanomaterials. Yeah, it was fulfilled with the colleagues from the German University, Universität Koblenz Landau and to a Polish University, Pedagogical University of Krakow. Uh, this is a photo of the students of our university during the practice at Pedagogical University of Krakow. This, in Krakow, the students studied at the Faculty of Mathematics, Physics and Technical Sciences. Putin students of our university participated in the program. 11 of them have got a master degree and three are going to graduate in May 2023. So with the Polish University, we developed this joint master program and it was very successful because all disciplines were subject to recognition at both partner universities. Unfortunately, the program with German University, it was not so productive because 10 students of uh, Nipro University were enrolled, but only three of them managed to obtain a degree from German University. The rest participated in academic mobility. This happened due to some difficulties with curricular confirmation of both universities. And Ukrainian students had to take some additional subjects at German University. And this resulted that some of them studied for, for such a long time as five semester. The language acquisition and cultural adaptation in Germany takes much longer time than in Poland. That's why the problem of unsatisfactory level of foreign language competence is one of the key issues in academic mobility. Uh, so that's one of the key issues. So the other problems uh, connected with organizing double diploma programs, they were like discrepancy between the duration of master degree programs in Ukraine and in European Union, the mismatch of the list of courses that student has to study and differences in courses contents. So unfortunately, Ukraine belongs to the group of countries with the smallest number of students who obtained a degree or studied outside the country of their origin. Yeah, and there are a lot of challenges that slow down the process of academic mobility development. So you can see some of these challenges. First of all, one of the challenges is that Ukrainian educational systems falls behind the European standards. And sometimes the problem is also with the language and some subjects that students chose for their studies, they are presented yeah, in the national languages and that is one more challenge. And sometimes there is also some conflict with timetable at the universities. So that's why the students are unable to attend the courses that they would like to. And the problem with implementation of ECTS, especially when the number of the credits for selected courses is different at European and Ukrainian university, universities. 
Also, there is the problem of insufficient funding because it may lead to some extra cost for participants of academic mobility and, uh, and sometimes the expenses for renting some room or renting some accommodation in some countries is also just very and very high for the students. Yeah, and also there is some mismatch of specialities between Ukrainian universities and European universities. You see that we have just extensive number of specialities in Ukraine, more than 100. Okay, despite the challenges, we have some expectations and we have some prospects for the development of academic mobility at Oles Gonchar Dnipro National Universities. And first of all, our prospects are connected maybe with the development of Ukrainian legislation, yeah, with the development of law on higher education. So we need some national framework of qualification that just mostly coincide with the European one. Uh, so to pay more emphasis for the independent work of students. Yes, then development of our educational programs are also one of our priorities. Yeah, because now at our university, we are doing our best to develop the competencies, competence approach and uh, paying particular attention at some learning outcomes. Of course, joint projects and uh, the mobility will lead to some integration, integration in research that is quite necessary for our university. And we expect to participate in some project groups, conferences, and symposiums as well. But one of the major expectation for Les Angeles Dnipro National University is the development of mobility cooperation and the increase of the number of students who participates in academic mobility. And of course, the increase of number of professors who participate in this mobility as well. Okay. Dear Ms. Milovan, uh, Safonova, I'm sorry. I'm so, thank you so much for your kind contribution. That was a pleasure to listen to you and to, to know more about the uh, situation in Dnipro. Uh, Oles Ganchar National University of Dnipro. Thank you so much. Uh, I have the honor to, to um, uh, give the words to our colleague from uh, Heidelberg University, uh, Katarin Reinhardt, uh, who is representing the International Relations Office of the University and who will address the issue of short-term uh, blended and uh, virtual mobility changes, uh, chances and challenges. Uh, dear uh, Katarin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, it's already switched on. So first of all, I would like to thank the colleagues and representatives of Tars University for the cordial welcome here in Prague and uh, for the perfect organization. So we are highly interested in interacting and networking, especially with the Eastern European partners. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, I chose this topic not because I'm an expert, but because I thought it's of interest for all of us here. We are all dealing with this uh, new, let's say new, short-term blended and virtual mobilities in our higher education institutions at the moment. And I'm really eager to get to know your experiences about it and to share our experience with you in the discussion later on. So I chose the example of For You Plus because um, uh, these mobilities, or especially the virtual mobilities, uh, were really pushing virtual mobilities at Heidelberg University forward. It's just one example for the, on, on central level. Of course, there are other examples on faculty level. Uh, the experience with virtual mobility differs from faculty to faculty. It really depends on the subject. Um, 
for example, the Faculty of Medicine has a lot of experience with virtual courses as well. Uh, that's just for the introduction. So definition, short-term mobility, two days up to two months, more flexible physical mobility duration to ensure exchange is accessible to students from all backgrounds, circumstances and study fields. You could also, I think in Erasmus program, it's uh, five days to up to 30 days if it comes to short-term doctoral mobility, but I took the example of four year plus, so it's defined with two days up to two months. Uh, blended mobility is a combination of physical mobility with a virtual component, facilitating a collab collaborative online learning exchange and teamwork. That's the definition in the program guide. And virtual mobility completely carried out online without physical component. Um, so just to give you some numbers um, from 4EU plus, uh, you see the incoming students. Uh, we don't have actually the number of physical blended and virtual mobilities because we are not tracking these numbers, but I can uh, tell you about the outgoing mobilities from Heidelberg. Uh, important to know, uh, of course, before 2019-20, there were no short-term blended or virtual mobilities. Um, and there is the corona gap in between. Uh, which impedes significant numbers because, of course, in 2019, 20, 2021, a lot of virtual mobilities took place because physical mobility was not possible that much. Um, and also to take into consideration increased mobilities, uh, uh, so for you plus increased mobilities through educational projects and shared which virtual courses, but you can see uh, an increasing number of physical, uh, of blended and virtual mobilities, but also luckily 21 and 22 also an increasing number of physical mobilities to the four EU plus universities. Um, yes, I wanted to start with the chances first. <laughs> so um, uh, we, we heard it already in the first presentation. Um, uh, it, uh, it gives the chance to include all, uh, all students from all backgrounds and involve also uh, students with disabilities or with family or with obligations at the university, which uh, hinds them to, 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 to conduct long-term mobility. Um, such it, it increases the number of mobilities and increases the student and dwarfs. Um, it meets diverse learning and training needs and, and, and it is, makes it easier to integrate innovative methods. Um, it accelerates internationalization of academic offer at participating higher ed education institutions. Uh, fosters diversity in course selections, it creates synergies, uh, uh, supplements to existing syllabus, so uh, it enriches the curricula of the participating higher education institutions. Um, it develops and uh, evaluate, or it gives the option to develop or evaluate and elaborate future cooperation. Uh, so you can start with cooperation through blended intensive programs and then continue with, with uh, cooperation on a larger scale like joint degrees or whatever. Uh, and it increases research oriented teaching, uh, especially through this blended intensive programs um, as uh, there are much more formats which, which can format which can be adapted in, in these uh, short time programs. And last but not least, it increases the employability through a collaboration with external partners from economy or otherwise. But of course, there are a lot of challenges also which we have to face. And uh, this is also the point where I'm really eager to know what, how you are dealing with it or if you are not facing these challenges maybe and you solved it already. Um, so, of course, the, the development of supporting structures, at, as we heard, um, virtual mobility has to be prepared very well. And uh, there is a lack of didactic skill support. We are working on it right, right now and we are developing it, but uh, still uh, it has to be developed. Uh, subject related requirements, so each subject has special requirement when it comes to didactical, didactical 
uh, skills uh, also in, in conducting the virtual mobilities, uh, the virtual courses. Uh, of course, electronic tools and IT expertise. Um, uh, the didactical background has to be developed, so um, how do we conduct exams in virtual mobility? How is the credit assignment uh, proceeded? Uh, which format do we use? How are the examination regulations um, uh, are conducted and so on between the participating uh, institutions. The funding is as well a problem um, because as most of you know, uh, this blended intensive programs, they just give organizational support to the participating institutions, which is a maximum amount of 8,000 euros, depending on the participants, uh, which is sometimes not enough to uh, to conduct all these uh, supporting structures, or it's a lot of workload as well for the for the academics involved. Um, status of students is a big big challenge <laughs> in our case um, because of the federal law, uh, higher education law. I will say something to this as well. Um, also the possibility of enrollment according to this national law. I don't know if you face similar problems, but uh, according to our law, um, you can't enroll students uh, spending less than 90 days at um, a German university. But of course we need to enroll the students participating in short-term mobility or in virtual mobility in order to, uh, to issue a transcript for them. And that's, that's a big thing. Um, but Heidelberg University brought in a paragraph um, or suggested a paragraph um, uh, containing a status European student, um, which allows short term mobility up to 90 days. Um, and it's not, it doesn't, uh, uh, it was not accepted yet, uh, but it's uh, on working process and uh, also our ministry. Uh, is positive about it and wants to support this because, of course, you have to deal with this in the future and you have to, you need to enroll the students. Uh, this is not as important if it comes to virtual mobility. Uh, there you have also the chance of an off-campus student um, stages where you are enrolled but you are not using uh, facilities and service uh, of the university and you don't pay any tuition fees. Um, but uh, with the European student status, you would be enrolled um, at, at uh, Heidelberg University or a university in Germany or in Baden-Württemberg because it's a federal system in Germany. Um, administrative issues, they are related to the other ones as well. How to track virtual mobilities uh, if students are not enrolled and application takes place on department level because that's uh, also happened with 4U+. Plus. Now they have to enroll via the 4U+ plus office. But if this is a special course uh, conducted of the par department of, I don't know, ge geography, and um, just several uh, students take part in it, um, uh, but you don't have any, uh, you don't know that they are taking part in it if no transcript is issued. Um, how to count and integrate virtual short-term mobilities and statistical recording. Uh, this is also important for financial issues. Um, how to allocate IDs to students on virtual short-term mobility because they need these IDs to sign in uh, to, for courses and relevant IT tools uh, at Heidelberg University. And of course, finally, how to issue transcripts and credit recognition. Um, um, yes, and last but not least, a big, big issue we are facing is the accommodation issue because uh, when it comes to short-term mobility, it is really hard to find uh, accommodation for one or two months in Heidelberg and that's really expensive. Um, and we are working on this since a long time, but we have not found a perfect solution for that. Um, so this is for the challenges and I put some ballots down for the 
valid points down, down for the discussion. Um, so, of course, the experiences, uh, your experiences with short-term mobilities or virtual mobilities. Um, also, your funding strategies would be interesting for us. For example, if you apply for uh, blended intensive programs, are you applying on purpose? Like, are you? Uh, are you launching a call before uh, at your faculties or are you just applying for a certain amount? It would be interesting for us. Um, is virtual mobility a strategic component of your internationalization strategy? Uh, of course, it is part of our internationalization strategy, but it's not, uh, it's not defined, the, the goal is not clearly defined, so this would be interesting for you, for, for us as well. Um, the demand of faculties and departments, so how do they deal with it? Are they interested in conducting uh, these mobilities? And maybe other administrative obstacles. Thank you very much for your attention. Mr. Reinhardt, thank you so much for your presentation and your kind participation. So the next speaker, I would like to, to um, ask uh, Ms. Catalina Nemetz from the um, uh, from ELTE at Virtual Around University Budapest to present uh, the topic outcomes of the key, key, key A2 project norm. The floor is yours. Something doesn't work. Okay, no. now it works. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. my voice is different. Uh, so, um, when I was preparing, I already realized that uh, the topic of uh, norm is such a huge that I have to narrow it down. But after today's discussion, I, ha I will narrow it down further because there are many, many uh, conclusions of the, this project that have already been covered. So, it, it is a nice summary. Uh, but I don't want to go to every single detail here, here. so um, it's just uh, for you to, oh, it looks a little bit different, um, sorry for that, uh, on my computer was a better layout, but um, um, here uh, you see like the basic information about NORM project, uh, which was a key A2 strategic partnership, lasted until November uh, last year, and we had nine partners, uh, uh, seven universities and two uh, university uh, or networks, university and the ESN. And basically, it, uh, the main topic was uh, identifying structural and systematic barriers to mobility, and the perception and the goal also was that one of these big uh, uh, obstacles will be the recognition and uh, a practical tool has been developed uh, to help curricula matching but this is quite specific so um, further on like just very very general conclusions as I mentioned uh, uh, have have been covered so um, the funding remains uh, one of the biggest obstacles next to the uh, credit um, recognition uh, and um, realizing the blended mobility uh, and how it can serve uh, making more mobility windows within the programs. Um, also the need for more in incentives to motivate uh, increasing numbers of students with distant learning experiences such as short programs. We were talking about this the whole day. Also joint and double de uh, degree programs uh, um, that uh, how valuable they are and how valuable they are in terms of career perspectives. Um, and very important one that uh, if we uh, find a way to recognize tough mobility, it, it, is, it has a direct impact of increasing student mobility, it's not to forget about this. Okay, more uh, subject-specific conclusions were uh, that um, these are the most problematic fields when it comes to mobility, uh, when it comes to the consortium partners, so health studies, law, teacher training and theology. However, already here we ha had two partner exceptions. Uh, the University of Versailles, I mistyped the CSV, sorry. Uh, University of Versailles at Elta uh, has an exception in law, and both universities has a structure in law where uh, in the middle of the studies, these are undivided studies in, in Elta, um, for example, so five years, you, uh, the program has in this international uh, politics and relations aspect, which is a very uh, mobility window friendly component. Um, 
And, uh, but on the other hand, the most common programs that tend to be the most mobile were computer science, economics, business studies, and tourism and international relations. Again, uh, an exception from ELTA, uh, how somehow our computer science students don't really tend to go to mobility. So the, this question of um, fields can be detected in, 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 in general terms, but as soon as we look at it from closer perspective, uh, we find exceptions and very different uh, structures of the programs. Uh, so uh, I wanted to narrow it down further to the Hungarian case. And um, it's very interesting to present something that you are the worst at in Europe. Uh, but I was thinking about uh, um, that this uh, is probably not a bad idea because um, in terms of self-reflection, Hungary had to really uh, uh, investigate why we are so bad at credit recognition. Um, so, as I uh, tried to mention, Hungary is last in the recognition charts. This has been an ongoing, a little bit already almost pessimistic debate in Hungary. How can we improve or is it improvable at all? Um, so, a, a, a huge step was taken in 2018, where a working group of Hungarian Rectors Conference was formed around this question, and it was a working group la uh, lasting for one year. <laughs> Uh, and a very, very, very good, nice report came out of identifying the present situation and, uh, and mapping exercise of, of, of international solutions and, and uh, that can be uh, directly uh, applied uh, at Hungarian uh, universities. So we reflect on, our, on ourselves, and these are some uh, statistics uh, from the report. Um, so we are far from the 20% uh, target goal. As you can see, it's 2.5% average participants in mobility. It's per academic year, so not uh, uh, graduate students, but um, the graduate sim uh, students' uh, number is, is, is similar. Um, the average number of recognized credits is 2.1. Um, don't look at me. <laughs> so it's, it's really, really, really low. Of course, you can see here listed some um, um, differences in, 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 in fields of studies, but this doesn't make a huge difference when we have the highest in sports, which is still 4.1. What are the reasons behind it? This is again something that we have talked about a lot, but this was a deep dive into the Hungarian situation where we figured out that this, the whole process is highly bureaucratic. When it comes to Erasmus Mobilities, we have the same process when it, uh, of recognition process when in terms of recognizing uh, uh, de um, de degrees uh, and we are attending, uh, uh, we are, um, uh, enrolling students and uh, recognizing their degrees, which is a much stricter procedure. Uh, um, no, I was thinking about uh, a recognition within degrees, sorry, uh, from, from uh, subjects taken from uh, another uh, university. Yeah, uh, so content of single subjects, uh, as it was uh, mentioned by Bernard, how much better is to not to concentrate on single subjects uh, content and it's, the decision shouldn't be on teacher's level. Um, and very practical organizational one that uh, the institutions tend to have also other priorities that hinder the, uh, the recognition and hinder uh, at the end of the day the students' personal progress because, for example, uh, universities or teachers uh, um, fear of losing students, and this is also a very old perspective. And also a lack of knowledge on basically of the, those people who are doing the recognition uh, on good practices and trends um, and misinterpretation of national rules as well. So the recognition, uh, recommendations were much more than here. I wanted to just point out some uh, that were of particular interest, like flexibility of the curricula. For example, creating modules, but it again was Bernard to, uh, showed the uh, structure of Kolika and how the modules can be structured and how bigger uh, categories can be defined. Um, 
in Hungary have very uh, low number of ECT courses. It's basically that uh, also teachers think about uh, less of uh, personal work of the students and they want to include all the work being done during the course. This is again not really um, recognition friendly and uh, many curricula have many prerequisites meaning that you, uh, un, uh, you have to have a, uh, a certain subject finished in order to attend the next one and it makes it very rigid and not flexible. Um, modification of point of view on recognition. Um, just two ideas here. Uh, first of all, it can the the mobility the uh, courses obtained during a mobility can uh, 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 can present a complementary knowledge to the students program, and this is a good thing. It doesn't have to be really similar to the one. Uh, this view was uh, pointed out by several universities. And uh, also the reverse burden of proof in the credit recognition processes, meaning that, for example, if uh, a, a, a course is not recognized uh, by the, after a request of the students, but it's, it is evident that uh, it is more or less uh, similar, then not the student has to um, um, uh, has to debate on it and prove that uh, this can be recognized, but the university has to prove that why it is such a um, why there is such a difference that it would endanger the uh, diploma at the end of the day if we recognized it. So this reverse thinking and reorganizing the decision making levels. So finding those actors who three the whole program. Uh, but are still see the field. So these would be in Hungarian context program or specialization directors uh, who are doing the decision and have a broader picture on this. And uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention uh, is what actions uh, ELTE, our university, took in order to uh, have a much better situation. Um, we represent the 50% of the outgoing mob Erasmus mobilities in Hungary. So if we change, it means that it probably will be um, seen on, on country level as well. And we want to um, yeah, uh, start the change ourselves. Uh, so we uh, uh, hold a mobility window day uh, for our faculty. Uh, in, in January 2020. And here is, uh, it's very interesting, we invited all the key actors within the um, uh, university. So vice things for education, heads of study of, uh, offices from the administrative part, and heads of faculty IROs. So this was a one-day workshop and where we shared uh, national and international good practices um, from other Hungarian universities, internal good practices, and then on, on, the, on the afternoon, uh, we had workshops where uh, all the faculty had uh, to think and brainstorm. Okay, we all of us have very specific programs, very specific situations. What, what are the good practices presented uh, that we could apply? So they, after the end of the brainstorming, they had to come up with some ideas. I have to admit that at this point we were not positive at all. So still many, many uh, um, f uh, faculty members said that this is impossible. Oh, of course. Okay. But uh, the next step was the renewal of IIAs and here an important part that the leadership decided to be committed to this process. And this is, I think, very important to, to the success story. Um, they decided that, okay, we do not renew any Erasmus IAS uh, of the new uh, Erasmus period if, they, uh, if the uh, specific program study field that is not presented in the IA does not have either a mobility window on the program or an equivalency table um, uh, done for that uh, partnership. So this is, and uh, I want to reflect here on the, in, uh, uh, the importance of good partnerships because of course this is also, uh, again, something that filters the best partnerships when you st start to uh, prepare, for example, an equivalency table and look at the uh, partner's course catalog and then you see whether it is really worth continuing or not. 
So, uh, we are very happy to announce that uh, in 74 programs, uh, mobility windows were created, and in 79 programs, equivalency tables were created, uh, and this affects 13,000 students. And all the other uh, IIAs, this isn't, there is no, not much left, uh, are to be finished uh, this academic year. So we are starting the next academic with all the IIAs having uh, one of these uh, tools. Um, this is the last slide, just some subject-specific solutions. Um, so. Um, uh, you can see the Faculty of Humanities. There are many, many small programs uh, that have a small number of students. They, it's not the best solution to have mobility window here, but uh, they created a very diverse uh, equivalency table. Also, the case of special needs education, they were the most reluctant because the field is very, very highly regulated in Hungary. Um, but at the end of the day, they looked at uh, the, their specializations from a new per perspective and managed to create um, from the flexible point, um, mindset now uh, still equivalency tables. Um, mobility windows in the uh, mo more flexible programs. And uh, I just wanted to mention at the end that mobility window also can mean many things. It doesn't mean that there is one strict semester uh, appointed by the institution. It can be more, it can be um, um, created by the institution, it can be uh, created by the students if the student is uh, given enough information which subject can be categorized in, the, in one of the semesters. Um, uh, and, of course, creating flexible cur curricula. Uh, that's all. Thank you for uh, your attention. Dear Katalin, thank you so much for, for such a great description of the uh, outcomes of the key K, K2 project norm. Uh, finally, uh, we have uh, uh, Mrs. Brozhova, uh, the head of uh, the Erasmus office of Charles University. Uh, by the way, my colleague, and uh, it is my pleasure to, to give you the floor, Esther, so the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, not very easy after all this uh, contribution, very enriching and very complex uh, today that we heard to uh, continue to, ha to have this closing, uh, closing pr uh, presentation, and I appreciate very much all contributions, and I look very much forward for the next discussion. I have prepared a very simple and short presentation that summarizes the practical use of virtual mobility at our institution in the field of virtual mobility. I divided the presentation in two uh, parts. The first one will be devoted to the, uh, to the use of virtual mobility within the four EU alliance, and the second one will be devoted to, it, to its use in the frame of uh, blended intensive programs as a novelty, as a relative novelty of the, uh, of the Erasmus program. Uh, the idea of implementing virtual mobility came into life uh, more intensively at our institution in 2019 when uh, the Alliance for EU Plus uh, was established. And uh, the goal was uh, to introduce and test in practice new ways of teaching and new ways of mobilities uh, within the Alliance, because it's always easier to, to test this kind of new news in uh, among and within the Alliance. In 2020, when the COVID pandemic struck, virtual mobility became uh, an effective tool for maintaining, and maintaining contacts and collaboration uh, between member institutions and because of many reasons, social, economic, political, and also unfortunately nature disasters and war in Ukraine, it persists as a very efficient tool for exchange students and for maintain our cooperation in general. Uh, in first, on first few slides, you can see some numbers uh, related to the virtual mobility. On the first number, you can see uh, the total number of courses and total number of students in, during the summer semester 2020 and 2021, in the academic year 2020-2021. 
it's only the number of students coming to our institution. If we would like to see the numbers among uh, the alliance, we can, we can see the, to the total number of opened courses, it's more than 700, and the total number of participant students is more than 1,000. As you can see, the number of participants was pretty high. It means 200 students per semester. And here you can see uh, the academic year 2020-2021. The number of courses and open courses and the number of participants is uh, almost uh, the same, a little bit lower than before. And it's because the pandemic was a little bit, uh, a little bit decreased. So we hoped to, to, uh, to enjoy again the physical mobility. So that was the reason uh, of these numbers. And finally, the uh, academic year 2022 and 2023, as you see, the number of courses is also almost the same, but, but, but the number of participants is slightly decreasing. Uh, what are the practical aspects of virtual mobility if we see it from our perspective, of perspective of Charles University? Uh, we have, as for the course land, we see that we have two kind of uh, courses, semester courses and uh, block courses. Semester courses uh, are held usually once a week and uh, takes uh, t uh, 90 minutes and are evaluated by with three to six ECTS. And block courses are uh, held twice per semester and uh, usually take six hours in, this, in the one block and are evaluated with, three, uh, with two ECTS. As for evaluation, of course, uh, they are written and stated in transcript of records and when seeing the perspective of mandatory and elective courses, uh, almost 95% uh, of them are elective. As for the capacity of the course, it depends on the course type. Uh, it starts on five participants, for example, and uh, it's uh, up to 150 students. We have to take into consideration that very often not only participants uh, from the Alliance are involved in the, in the, in the courses, so there is a combination also of degree students and Erasmus Plus exchange students. As for the admission procedure, the course offer is available throughout the year on our student portal of the Alliance. And uh, it's also divided in two sections. You have, uh, or students can, can choose uh, between open courses where they can apply anytime throughout the year and limited courses that access is open according to each institution terms and usually, of course, because of uh, before each semester. And uh, when talking about the types of courses, we have two types of courses. One, uh, one type is uh, uh, created according to the four EU plus rules. We have four EU plus courses that are created within the airlines as a part of educational project or mini grants as a C funding uh, related to the specific field of education. Shared courses that meet common four EU criteria and open courses that are less strict in, uh, in, in the creation. And they are almost uh, the same like courses that are offered uh, usually to other students out of the uh, alliance. And okay, according to the content, we have temporary courses. They change every year according to the faculty options and possibilities. We have regular courses. They are repeated every year. And we have uh, so-called on-purpose courses. They are created as a pure virtual courses and usually complemented with specific, uh, specific uh, tools like videos and educational materials and they are typical for uh, example for medical faculties. What are the benefits of virtual mobility student exchange? We already heard all the benefits and we know them but uh, just from our perspective uh, there is no need for selection procedures because we already know that for physical mobility, because of funding, we are allowed to do selection procedures, but in virtual mobility, the capacity is the uh, most important uh, uh, 
the most important reason how to do so or not to do so. So in this case, there's no need for selection procedure. There is more tolerance in exchange number balance because of the same region, because of not, no need to physical presence, presence at, uh, at uh, lectures. So it's much easier to keep the balance or not to take it into consideration when exchanging students on virtual mobility. And it's also related to the less admission criteria because usually it's enough uh, the, to, uh, to uh, confirm the study stage and field of study and no other criteria are needed to be applied. There is more flexibility in student study plan at home institution. There is no need to interrupt studies at home institution during the mobility or to prolong the studies because of physical mobility, because of changing the study plan. Uh, also, of course, financial savings, uh, the same reason physical activity requires accommodation uh, and uh, other costs related to the life abroad, and also saving the time. So you can, you can simply, simply start uh, your education during the evenings or other, uh, other day times um, without interrupting your study plan at your home institution. And you can also enrich the study program because of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary possibilities during the virtual mobility. And we can call it also as a mobility on trial because some students are not courage enough to go to the physical mobility so they can try how it looks like to be in the international uh, environment and to, uh, be, uh, to be lectured in a different uh, foreign language. And of course, it's also related to simplified documentation as a learning agreement we, ha we have created for, among the alliance, uh, special documentation to make uh, the exchange easier, but I suppose that we can also apply it for other virtual mobility. What is the motivation for teaching and administrative staff? Of course, financial, that's uh, very mostly a very good motivation for all groups uh, of, uh, of uh, staff, of course. So uh, we reward uh, with special funding uh, the faculties who open new courses and also motivate, uh, we also motivate uh, lecturers and teachers with reward through the special funding. And what is also important is the cooperation with other academics and lecture rotation during the courses. So we can have lectures when uh, one week is uh, lectured by one uh, university and the other by other. So it brings also a uh, big advantage to this, uh, to this uh, cooperation and to this kind of teaching. And uh, personal development is also very, very important for academics, sometimes more than others because they should experience other form of teaching than on-site and see uh, their uh, possibilities. And of course, international environment that is uh, usually related to the physical mobility, but in this case, it's almost the same in uh, virtual. And uh, this is the second part of the presentation, the blended intensive programs and our experience, as I said, as uh, blended intensive programs are relative novelty of the, uh, of the Erasmus program and brings many, uh, many challenges uh, and opportunities to us. And uh, we can participate as an institution in two roles, one as a participant and one as coordinator. I would not be focused on uh, to be participant because we participated in many blended intensive programs uh, during last year and it was really very enriching and um, very good both for our students and for staff. But as for coordinators, that's another story because it's a really uh, very difficulty to uh, keep the program um, efficient and uh, productive as, as we want for the reward that we, that we have. Um, we have coordinated in, as an institution in last year three blended intensive programs, one with Faculty of Arts on History of Drama, the second was uh, with Faculty of Education on Teaching Strategies for STEAM subjects, and the third one was with Faculty, on Phar of, Faculty of Pharmacy on Research Methods and Geriatric Pharmacotherapy. I will show you just very briefly how it looked like. Uh, 
the Faculty of Arts had a virtual part in duration of one day. That's the usual kind of uh, how to how to uh, how to make this possible because in implanted intensive programs we always tend to have complement uh, of virtual and physical mobility in one block and we would like to have it as much uh, efficient as physical mobility as one part could be. But usually the faculties use it as a very simple introduction of student or staff group and that was the case uh, at the Faculty of Arts and their uh, blended intensive programs. The physical part took five days in Prague and uh, uh, the participants were 30 students, but uh, just 15, uh, no, sorry, 20 of them as obligatory and six staff members, both teaching and administrative. And the participants of the BIP were two universities from two countries, that's, uh, that's the rule of the, of the program. Uh, generally speaking, the program was practically oriented and uh, uh, they used networking among different student theatre groups and you, they used interdisciplinary theatre techniques and they created a new teaching formats of philological and pedag pedagogical curricula. As for the blended intensive programs of the Faculty of Education, the virtual part took two days, one before and one after the physical mobility. It's a very efficient kind how to complement the mobility in one, um, in one uh, piece. So before the mobility you can prepare all the things and after you have reflection, so it makes it more completed. Uh, the physical part took six days and the participants were 36 students and six staff members. Uh, in, the blend, in this program, three university, universities from two countries participated, and it was didactic, didactically oriented. Uh, they implement uh, the innovative education practices and create new multidisciplinary programs, and applied uh, Erasmus Plus priorities during the program, inclusion, digitalization, sustainable development, and active civic participation. Altogether, 27 hours of group, group work uh, in an international team were realized. And the last one, a faculty of pharmacy. Uh, the virtual part was only in the beginning as a preparation for on-site activities as laboratory techniques. Uh, the physical part took five days and uh, we had uh, 26 students and 15 staff members as participants and nine universities from eight countries. It was uh, really impressive that they, uh, they, um, uh, they could do so uh, in such a short time because as mentioned, this limitation of five days, it's uh, uh, not very easy how to implement all the program in just a short period. It was methodologically oriented uh, thanks to the, to the laboratory techniques they used during the program. And they shared uh, uh, of research topics among PhD students. Uh, the specific of this program also was that it was specifically for PhD students. And implementation, of course, again, of innovative education practices and the development of innovative programs in multidisciplinary subjects. And after that, as an output, we will have the publication. So that's another, that's another additional um, value of uh, this program. And uh, in the end, just a few pictures from the, from the this blended intensive program of the Faculty of Pharmacy. This is all from my side. Thank you very much, and I look forward very much for discussion. Thank you so much, dear sir, for your uh, kind contribution and uh, wonderful presentation. And now uh, uh, I have the privilege to open the discussion parts of uh, the round table. So, and I believe that uh, the conservation, I'm sorry, will be even more fruitful thanks to the information and ideas uh, you have uh, presented during the, the round uh, table. So, um, First of all, I uh, would like to ask our online participants uh, for their questions.
I'll ask my colleagues from IT. Uh, I cannot see uh, the, the, uh, the hands. So no questions from, from our online participants. Maybe I should ask our colleagues from the audience. Yeah, I, I see the hands, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, Professor Isaac, you, you, the, floor, the screen is yours. <laughs> How, how, how to, to start? There are such a rich number of presentations, very practical, that also have highlighted the, the various problems that ECTS and the Bologna area, and we have all tried to deal with. And of course, when you come to university level, then you really see how, how difficult it is to make everything work. I was very impressed, though, for example, by well, by all the contributions and hearing about how it was possible for uh, ELTE to, to uh, convince people to have a mobility window, that's quite important. And of course, uh, promoting the whole idea that the, the, the teacher is not someone who pushes substance of some sort into, into students' brains, but rather a facilitator of learning in order for the, the necessary competences to be formed. And of course, it's a completely different mentality. And how many times we've had these difficulties, particularly at the beginning, where no one could see that maybe studying a classic in Italian gave similar competences to studying Italian, uh, a classic in Latvian. And so it requires a major uh, leap for uh, academics to realize that maybe what they're doing is facilitating people in learning how to do things, how to think, how to study, how to do research, rather than teaching them uh, single contents. And it really requires getting away from the content. So I was, there was, there have been so many interesting and important uh interventions that it's just practically it's practically not possible to say i have a huge list now and it, it seems to me that one kind of a, a a thread through many has been both in the joint degrees in the um, double degrees in the virtual mobility and everything else recognizing that uh curricula uh, don't have to match from a content point of view. And that in some fields, this is more difficult. In others, it's easier because they may be uh, fair, fairly, but usually not standardized because the whole approach may be different, even if the final result is to be the same. So I would say, I don't think I could really ask a question because it's just, thank you. Very interesting and good to see how these things are going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Isaacs, for your kind words. And uh, I just wanted to add that after the event, uh, the, the core idea was to create the position paper uh, where we uh, would like to include our ideas and recommendations, suggestions and so on into one particular paper as a main output of the today's workshop to the today round table so we do believe that we will provide such uh, such a document in, in in near future and to make it possible to share with our colleagues from uh, the european union Univers universities and also to our colleagues from uh, universities of the eastern partnership uh, region so uh we have still we have time uh, for the discussion, and of course, it is uh, it is mainly about Erasmus area. So maybe our colleagues uh, somehow share their experiences, or maybe. Yes, may I try? Yes, of course. And I do believe that I can hear uh, for a while. Uh, but anyway, uh, yes, the discussion part is still here. And uh, the floor is, is your, yours, dear colleagues, to, to, uh, to ask questions and to, to, uh, to provide answers.
uh, on international credit mobility as a, as a tool that can be used for Ukrainian uh, universities uh, to, uh, uh, for mobilities for student exchange and staff exchange. So I would like to ask you about your experience uh, in this matter. Professor Isaac. Uh, so I, I suppose that the question was concerning the Ukrainian universities. Uh, if I may, but I will not switch on my camera uh, because I'm, I'm on the way, so it's not so convenient. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Uh, during the, so you asked about the ICM uh, experience and uh, our experience in ICM. So it's quite interesting because um, under this statistic, for example, our university, Sarasvetchenko National University of uh, Kiev, we we have uh, the, the majority of amount of the uh, ICM projects and uh, the students uh, that were formed at the ICM. Uh, now we have more than uh, 150 partnerships within the interinstitutional agreements on ICM. Uh, during the period of the last five years, uh, we had up to three, up to three thousand of students that were used ICM. So uh, these uh, these statistics were done under our National Erasmus Office. And uh, as I said uh, in my speech, and maybe I will emphasize more on that. Um, during the last year, uh, when I spoke about the chaotic mobility in the very beginning. Uh, what, we, what we face? We face the chaotic new partners within the ICM. Uh, it was not uh, on purpose, but it was under the conditions. Uh, for example, uh, and I really appreciate our partners when they, uh, they, when they met our students for example, in March or April last year, after the massive exodus. And then they just switched on this mechanism on ICM, and we're using that. It's really very, it was really very fruitful instrument, very fruitful. Um, now you, you know that now this process of new calls on K1 now isn't uh, it was fulfilled. Now we also have uh, new partnerships. Uh, so, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, under the official information uh, from European Commission, uh, there were two decisions adopted by the European Commission. Uh, the first one was adopted uh, in June, in the end of June last year, on the increasing of the budget. For the uh, for the ICM to to include Ukrainian students, and if I'm not mistaken, the last decision of the Commission was maybe some months ago. Uh, so on on additional funding with the K1. Uh, so it's a very fruitful instrument as for an experience from our university. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your kind contribution. So uh, still we have a few minutes to, till the end, and I would like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Asinkov. There were many things that were said in this last round table, and uh, so some ideas might get lost, and there's one point that uh, I would like to stress. Uh, we are talking about virtual mobility, this means online learning, and that needs uh, new and different teaching methodologies, and so that needs academic development. It was mentioned by some of you, and you're, you're perfectly right, um, but I think it's really something that we have to take into account, and we have probably to develop much more than we are doing at the moment. We have seen in the COVID crisis that the emergency online teaching is bad. <laughs> um, and, but online teaching can be good. <laughs> so the question is how to make it good. 
and how to teach our teachers how to make it good. And so we need the support structures. It was on one of your slides. I don't remember who had it on the slide, support structures, yes. So we need these support structures and we can also work together on this. We can have uh, actually, well, um, workshops and so on where, where we have teacher training, academic teacher training. Thank you so much, Mr. Helsinko, for your for your kind words. And say so, yes, Kathleen. This, yeah, to add to this topic, that uh, um, this was also our focus when it comes to blended intensive programs, uh, because we realized that we, when we started implementing the virtual part, was all like, okay, let's do some meeting because we have to do it. Uh, and it's very contrary to what, the, for example, the Commission Handbook says about how we should pedagogically organize um, the blended intensive programs and blended mobility. Uh, there are many goals mentioned, but I had the same feeling. I really like your presentation when you show this uh, curve that uh, the same feeling like when you read it uh, for an average person, for teacher, it is not possible to uh, to, to think about practical implementation of this. Um, so we started doing some, we had one meeting with now the faculties and invited an education expert who tried to give like very, very practical solutions on what to think about. Uh, especially it was interesting because she did a, a whole uh, systematic literature review on new mobility formats and how they uh, are connected to the competences that are related to mobility. So she was uh, already researching that, okay, like one week or two weeks or three weeks or virtual, but how, uh, what competences can be developed, but how you achieve that development, how you have to organize the activity. So based on that research, she was um, able to give some tips, but we, we identified it as a very minor first step and there's so much more to, that has to be done when it comes to, in, even in context of blended learning and um, we need blended learning experts and so on. So I completely agree that this is, this is a huge part that we have to work on. Thank you so much, Katalina. And uh, Katarina? Oh, no. No? Okay. May I directly comment on it? Um, do you have special units at your university in charge of developing such structures or skills? In our university we do, yes. We have a um, um, pedagog pedagogical support unit and uh, it has an academic development part. Actually, I'm uh, in charge of it, so <laughs> yeah, I know it's pretty well. We do have this uh, center for development of structures, study structures and teaching uh, as well. And they are at the moment very much concerned with these issues. But uh, still there is a need to develop, to further develop. So I totally agree with you. It's one of the biggest parts. Uh, thank you so much. So do we have another question for these parts? I really want to reflect on your questions, Katarina, because you have so many interesting questions at the end of your presentation. Uh, but I just want to focus on one thing that we, uh, regarding the registration problem that you mentioned, we were thinking about uh, the blended mobilities as semester mobilities. So we registered them accordingly. Mm -hmm. Also, the handbook of the commission um, basically, in my understanding, starts from this um, idea that this is uh, like a virtual course that has a, a, a physical component. Uh, and this uh, made it much easier for us to manage these mobilities and also include them in the statistics and from the administrative point of view. Um, so this is how we, how we tackle this, this problem. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> but um, how many days they have been present at your institution, if, it, if we talk about blended? Yeah, it's typically just five days, but since we have the process because of the COVID of, uh, of uh, e even regular semester students arriving later on, uh, not uh, going through the regular registration process of so showing like some identification documents, for example, uh, we have the process to basically register students that are not present for the whole course. They are 
uh, if, if we are the hosts, we register them as the participants since there is a virtual um, uh, activity going on. And okay, yes, the physical part is short, but this is like a semester course transcript at the end of the day, yes. Okay, this would, would not work with our administration. <laughs> So them also because of, uh, of course, statistical reasons, mm -hmm. and of course because of the access to the to the system, just to have a transcript of records at the end. But of course because of the short uh, physical mobility for us is the same like long term mobility because we have to register them, we have to know that they are here, and we have to give them the, um, uh, the confirmation of study period. So for us is the same, and we administer and register them them on the same way like other other mobilities. Okay. Yes, dear Monica. Yes, please. Um, I would like to ask... Microphone for me, okay. Uh, to add that we work on a project that lasts at least three years because we want to have uh, blended uh, in courses uh, uh, that be innovative as requested by you. So we create a partnership and we uh, every year one partner coordinates the course and the length of, of the uh, practical part of the course can stand bas basically uh, on the, the program and the, the and all is, uh, is organized uh, have, uh, and it's centered on the program that has, is established from time to time. So um, this is what we, we do, we want to do. Thank you so much for your questions. So... Uh, Question to our Ukrainian colleagues <laughs> and to Madame Safranovo. Um, just of the things that you said, and because I know less Ukraine, um, you said one of the problems of the Ukrainian educational system is the excessive number of specialties. 121 was on your slide. Uh, what do you define a specialty? Uh, what is, is, does this mean uh, that's the a degree program, 121 different degree programs, or what, what, what is behind yeah, that yeah, definition? Yeah, that's right. It's for bachelor. For bachelors, it's like 121 degrees, different times of degrees. It's just very narrow specialties that we have like in our countries. And that's why it's like difficult to, you know, to maybe to connect our speciality and the speciality in some, you know, in some foreign universities, you know, like that's a major problem. I guess you do not have 121 degrees in all universities or so. so. Uh, well, let's take my my discipline in chemistry. Uh, you have the same chemistry degrees in the different universities over Ukraine, or uh, does every university define that themselves? <laughs> You know, we have within chemistry, we have different names of this of specialities about chemistry, not not only one, but like at our so, university, uh, up to 10 names of the specialities connected with chemistry. So it's also a That's problem inside the Ukraine for, for mobility inside Ukraine, I guess. Mm -hmm. yes, 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 that's yes. our problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, we have the question from the Vice Rector Victor Grasso from the Dnipro University. Uh, dear Professor Grasso, the, the screen is yours. Yes, and now we still cannot hear you. Uh, Please uh, unmute. Me, yeah? Yes, now we can hear. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, it's not a question. I would like to add something to Natalia's speech and uh, Natalia's answer uh, for, for to this uh, previous question. You see, okay, as uh, for example, uh, chemistry. Yeah, we have one specialty chemistry, one, but. Uh, Every university in the frame of their 
uh, all on uh, all on proposition or all on uh, um, advantages can divide this uh, specialty chemistry uh, by different uh, um, educational programs. So we can have chemistry, one specialty, and uh, under this specialty, for example, three different educational programs with different disciplines, with different uh, tasks, and so on. For example, chemistry of uh, solid materials, chemistry of, uh, I don't know, industrial chemistry of, uh, of solvents. Uh, it's not uh, precise names I imagine now, but it's uh, some it's some kind of example. So, in practice, under one specialty chemistry, we can have one, two, three, or more. Uh, in many cases, it uh, this. Uh, uh, Educational programs orient, oriented uh, are oriented on uh, special um, special industry or special demands of uh, some specific narrow uh, area because you see and you know that uh, chemistry is quite a wide area of uh, of science of research and uh, practice. So that's why uh, so many specialties we can have. On the other hand, uh, for example, we have specialty biology and biochemistry. As for me, I'm biologist and I don't understand what's the difference, why biochemistry is not inside biology and what about uh, biophysics, zoology, and botany, why biology and biochemistry. But it's a, a decision of our ministry, but and uh, I don't know why, as for me. <laughs> well, and um, I would like to add some words. Uh, I would say that uh, some words of my uh, Gratitude to you, to Charles University, to all, all of you, all universities of the cons our consortium. You see, um, during the this during this uh, meeting, only one day, but uh, there were six air raid uh, warnings, six sirens in my Dnipro city, and. Uh, as I can see, yes, there is this air war, air siren just now. So we are under the danger of attack uh, every day. And uh, uh, due to your efforts, we can feel your support. We can see our future in international collaboration, in uh, education, in uh, research. And uh, as uh, most people of Ukraine would like to be a part of European Union, that's true. And um, that's why your support, your efforts, your, uh, att your attention to this uh, situation in Ukraine is quite important for us. Thank you. Dear Vice Rector, dear Professor Grasso, thank you so much for your kind words and your for your kind cooperation and everything that you did uh, you know, for our cluster and uh, for, for our inter-university cooperation. So th thank you so much. Thank you. And so we have uh, Katalin who is going to ask. Yeah, just very shortly, I just wanted to thank you to 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 present for us uh, this attitude of uh, of concentrating on the most important things. Uh, so uh, I'm really inspired by uh, your attitude now in Ukraine. Um, so just wanted to say that this it, it impacts me personally uh, very very much, and thank you very much.
Thank you so much, dear colleagues. Uh, now I think is the time uh, for the conclusion. And so first of all, I would like to thank all of you for your kind participation, for your time, for your cooperation, for your kindness, and for everything you did for these uh, events. We are so happy to see you here, and uh, I do believe that in the future we will have another opportunity to, to come together and to discuss relevant topics. Once again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much for your participation. All the best.